And I, I get that you try to keep it as lean and mean and as efficient as possible. I get that. Um, but is there an adjustment made or a review or analysis of what Vermonters can afford, even if it's not consistent with your efforts to get it as low as possible? We have in our budget, which drives um, that number. Um, we're looking at what can we do to to decrease that number. When we put together our budgets, we we look um, on first pass on what other adjustments can we make to those cost inflation assumptions. When so the rate that you see today is not the first rate um, that you would have saw that you would have seen had we just submitted the budget on first pass. Uh, we went back through all of our adjustments, trying to make the, the number as low as possible, looking at what we were planning for salary increases, talking to our supply chain uh, leaders to say, is there something that we can do about this cost inflation? Is there a way to offset it? Um, looking at, um, at lower cost alternatives that might have different inflation assumptions tied to them. Um, so we do go through that process from when we first generate a rolled up budget to what you see today. Um, we're definitely thinking about affordability um, and trying to make that uh, trying to make that rate increase um, as low as possible. We're also at the same time uh, trying to produce trying to pursue other non-commercial rate increases. Um, there, those opportunities still exist out there uh, to try to to try to make the the care that we're providing more affordable um we still think that there's that there's a good chance that we can make those happen in future years they just we couldn't get them across the across the finish line for this uh for this particular budget um steve i don't know if you want to add anything to to that chair foster i'll start with healthcare is expensive and healthcare to tertiary academic medical center the things that we do are amazing um, and I'm proud of them, but they cost a lot of money. Our jobs do our very best to have them cost the least possible they possibly can for Vermonters. That's by providing high quality care, safe care, minimizing complications, and then comparing ourselves. We know from the Medicare benchmark data that we're in the bottom 25th percentile for costs for the, the care we deliver. Is, um, it is expensive. We work every single day to make sure we deliver the most keeping it as low cost as we can, but labor costs are 61% of our budget. They're going up. Healthcare is a people business. We need to pay our people well to provide high quality care. The equipment we're using is expensive, and we have a lot of other pressures right now that are making it even more expensive. Access right now, we're paying people extra to catch up. We're keeping that extra operating room open by paying overtime and special pay. We're paying people on Saturdays to do mammograms, um, CT scans, MRIs to keep up, to get caught back up. Um, but I do want you to know that everything that we do, we benchmark ourselves, um, but we are we acknowledge healthcare is expensive and it's on all of us to work to keep it as low cost as we can while providing good access, safe, high quality care. The, the other thing that I would add, Chair Foster, just in terms of the affordability, um, question and decision point that we made before we submitted this budget. Um, I think we highlighted earlier on, I think Sonny had this in his comments um, at the beginning that we've incurred $90 million more cost inflation than what we put in our FY23 and 22 budgets. Um, that means that the commercial rate increase, the Medicare rate increase and the Medicaid rate increase did not cover that cost inflation. When we put together the budget, there was discussion both um, in terms of that cost inflation that wasn't covered. Do we add an additional piece to our required rate increase to make up for the fact that we didn't, we undershot exactly how much our cost inflation was going to be this past year? We also had a discussion about the fact that we are significantly um, depleted from a cash reserve perspective, which 
means that we're falling behind in terms of capital investments. And so we had a discussion, do we add more to the rate increase to account for the fact that um, we have a significant amount of cost inflation that wasn't covered by rates and um, that we we need to we need more resources to take care of uh, of Vermonters. And we decided not to do that. Uh, and it was all due to the affordability um, question. What we've submitted in the budget is truly what we need uh, to start to, to make some progress here on our finances and, and meeting the needs of our. Partially due to the volume of questions, but so if I interrupt you, that, that's why. Um, just yes or no, does the network look at how much money Vermonters have to pay for increased health insurance costs when it does its budgetary process? I'm not aware of a, a data source, if you would, if you will, that would tell us that. Um, in terms of what's available to pay, um, what Vermonters are available to pay. I mean, we know that um, there still is some subsidies that are going to continue in terms of the uh, the exchange uh, programs. Uh, we, you know, we're, we keep tabs on that to see if that changes. Um, but in terms of a of a number that you can point to in terms of what you know what is available out there for Vermonters to. Uh, to pay, um, we're just not aware of any index or data source that um, that's out there. Understood. And do you agree that the affordability of health care is one important, and two that the care board should be considering it in in light of your budget requests? They certainly should be um, taking it into consideration in the the budget requests. But in addition, one of the other um, 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 needs that the Green Mountain Care Board needs to needs to needs to look after is the access to appropriate quality health care for Vermonters. That balance between financial sustainability, access to care, and affordability all has to be taken into consideration in terms of what you're looking at from a from our budget request. Yeah, agreed. So some of the public comment we received that happened with the VAS request, it's happening with the budget process, is that um, non-hospitals uh, like primary care, independent practices, mental health, physical therapy, long-term care, they're saying that their rates that they're getting from insurance companies are really, really small, if not non-existent, um, as compared to uh, UVMs and other hospitals. If we credit um, that assertion and i guess i'm getting at is should we consider that the system and the, what the system's getting in a rate when we determine your rate yeah, i don't know if i can if i can answer that uh that question um are you are you asking it in terms of is there other unregulated entities that you should be taking into consideration in the rates that they're receiving in terms of our rate request or? Yeah, so you talked about access, but what I'm told and the board is frequently hearing is that there's access issues because, you know, the independent primary care practice down the street can't afford to raise nursing salaries and they can't afford to pay extra to have a nurse work on the weekends and that's harming access and so you discuss your access challenges and the need for rate to do that to pay, you know to care for your community appropriate point my question is should the care board be considering all the other providers in the system in considering your rate request so i, I i'm not sure how to quite answer that question but i will say that certainly you can see very clearly that our decisions um, in terms of access have negatively impacted um, our financials. Um, so the the whether it's a private practice physician group, um, a nursing home that's not you know that's not connected to our network, any of those uh, those providers, um, if they don't have 
uh, enough resources, they do restrict access, um, and it has a very direct impact on uh, on our organizations. But I don't know how to answer the question in terms of how you take a look at an unregulated entity and factor that into to these deliberations here on our on our budget. Yeah, and that's what I'm struggling with. They say if we give you 13.5 percent they're gonna get left out and have a very difficult time getting rate. In fact, historically, they don't get rate if we give large increases to the hospitals. That's what they say. And so they can't provide the access to their community. And my question is, should I be cognizant of that and considering that and how much rate I give to the hospital? Because I get that the rate will be good for the hospital's access. My concern is it's not good for the rest of the system's access. Yeah, sorry, I can't. Uh, I, I can't give you any guidance on that. Is that is that actually true? Um, we're frequently told that, and it looks like from the data we've seen that the hospital rate increases are historically um, significantly larger than non-hospitals. But I just wonder if if they got a larger increase, if that would change their access or not. And do you have regulatory control over what they get or don't get? And is that like sort of out of scope of what we should be talking about? I'm I'm not having a hard time just kind of figure that out. Um, that's my question to you. If you think that's appropriate, clearly the top half of goes with how our ability to provide access goes, and so. I think there are going to be Vermonters that can afford to pay for and get care um, with private practitioners, et cetera. But I don't think that's what we're looking at. We're looking at, can we provide access to everybody? And when we lay out what I see as our request, it is trying to do that. Um, and so I don't, I don't know what to do with the private practitioner or the private group that is taking care of a subset of patient patients. but. It's hard for me to, it's hard for us to opine on that. That's a different, it seems like a different group. Okay. Um, it is a different, different group, but I take it your position is that the care board shouldn't, should be reviewing your budget and only your budget and your financial need and not the impact that they might have on the rest of the Vermont healthcare system that's trying to provide care as well. No, that's not what I said. I said that if we have knowledge about what that direct impact is, and we should be really careful about that, about how they make decisions when they when we don't know, um, then it becomes really difficult for both of us from our end and from your end to be able to say if we did this, this would what would happen to our private practice group that we don't really have vision into. Um, I'll try and finish up here. Um, your budget request for fiscal year 23, the budgeted margin. How much was that? Was it 1.7, 2 percent, something like that? Mark, do you happen to have that? Hang on, Rick. I'm pulling it up right now. I had it had it in the narrative from last yep. year, page 15, as 1.7. Um, actually, the budget uh, that's in the budget system, I have two percent. Two percent or thirty nine point three million. And year to date, where is the University of Vermont Medical Center on margin? Hang on, let me get that right now. I have that too. The budget tool has it at three percent. Year to date actual through July, and I'm just making sure that I'm looking at the right hospital. Uh, the actual is 2.1% or 35.1 million through July. Just want to keep the, is it network and University of Vermont Medical Center? Just want to make sure that we're doing each of those correctly, right? Actually, I am only referring to University of Vermont Medical Center right now, so. Thank you. Okay. And. You said there was $90 million of cost inflation in fiscal year 23 that wasn't budgeted for? 22 and 23. 
22 and 23. Okay. And so notwithstanding that $90 million cost inflation, you're still at about what you had budgeted for your fiscal year 23 margin. Is that right? Correct. So you're able to absorb that 90 million, whatever part of it is in 23 without having to see your margin compress. Yeah, we have a fair amount of still one time dollars um, in the in the in the FY23 results. So we've received some FEMA dollars. Uh, we've received some catch up payments for GME IGT arrangements. Um, so there are some 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 numbers in there that won't continue into FY24. Um, but um, without those, obviously, the, the cost inflation uh, overruns would have would have produced a much different uh, result so far in FY23. When the care board made its 23 decision, it, it considered those in determining that the rate could be lower than the 19.9% requested, right? It did. We we at that point in time we were looking at. I mean, we still are produce, pursuing hospital directed payments um, as as a as a as an opportunity for our network to reduce the uh, future commercial rates. We talked about that. Um, they haven't materialized, but it's still something that we're um, that we're pursuing. Okay. So I, I want to bring up a topic that was addressed in your intro. Um, I think, you know, Dr. Epen, you said working with us, the care board and the medical center together on cost containment. And Mr. Vincent, you said something about um, the increase last year was very much appreciated. And it it sounds like that increase, which is hard to do, to, you know, to prove that kind of level. Um, but after the board did it, it seems like the, the amount of money the care board gave uh, in its rate increase decision was not wrong it seems appropriate you had this 90 million unexpected cost you had these the gme money and the medicare reimbursement change you had the fema money and you have the margin you had anticipated um, but you know after we make budget decisions that aren't consistent with what you submit there's generally some fairly caustic language and it's inconsistent with you saying you're trying to work together with us and saying that you appreciated it um, there was some media the day of the decision, which I think called the care board's decision, uh, at least implied that it was wrong or not based on anything. And Dr. Leffler, you sent a message to UVM employees where you said, quote, um, the care board approved a smaller amount of 14.77. How they arrived at this number is unclear. We work in an evidence-based mission-driven field and so strongly believe that this type of dartboard decision making doesn't help our patients, our community, or healthcare across the state of Vermont. I wasn't involved in that decision, but looking at the data now, it looks to me like that decision improved affordability for Vermonters and UVM still hit its margin. Are we gonna see this kind of rhetoric if the care board doesn't provide the kind of rate request you're seeking this year? So I won't speak to the 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 rhetoric that was uh, that was produced last year, um, uh, Chair Foster. But I can tell you what we're looking for through this process is whatever the decision is that it truly is based on data and facts. Um, I feel like we pro we provided uh, all the data um, in, excruci in excruciating detail to help you all make um, for the board to make their decision. Um, we did talk about the the impacts that we could see um, in terms of rate relief, which did factor in uh, into the into the the lower rate. Certainly, we did not know at the time that we could pursue FEMA dollars. Obviously, we we knew that it was still a possibility, but we had to significantly scramble to find ways to offset the fact that the commercial rate. Uh, came down, and the rationale behind it uh, was uh, was a little bit harder to understand. What we're looking for this year is um, is the decision that's made. Um, if it's made based on the data that you see, and that um, that you you're, you're basing it on the 
the the facts that we've presented, the facts that you have available to your um, to the board um, that we'll we'll have to take a look and see exactly what impact that has. I think we're going to talk about that in executive session, but I I I, sh I share with you that the budget that we have submitted, we without knowing you know what other dollars may be available next year, this is what we what we need. And I think you can see in our financial metrics, we're still going to be struggling financially next year. Um, the projections that we've made for um, for um, the impact this will have on our cash reserves to reinvest in the organization, we're not we're not making a huge leap um, in just one year. This is going to take time to uh, to 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 rebuild. Um, and so that that's what I would that's what I would share with you. And, right. and Chair Foster, since you called me out, I'd like to be able to respond. The budget that we submitted for our 23 budget took hundreds of hours to put together. And when we brought the budget to the Green Mountain Care Board, it was our very best estimate of what we thought it was going to cost to provide high quality care to Vermonters for fiscal 23. There were things that we were unsure of when we submitted the budget that we're very grateful did come to pass. FEMA dollars and other things. As what you're talking about, the email I sent was an internal email to staff. And my specific comment was as we presented our budget, the hearing, there were people in the meeting back and forth in real time on the public session determining kind of a middle ground, like, well, I want to cut it by this much, we should cut it by that much, let's meet in the middle. That felt to me not fact-based compared to the work we put in. After the budget was approved and the other dollars came in, we've worked unbelievably hard at the medical center this year, every, all 8,000 people here to turn us around. We lost $24 million in fiscal 22, and we have a positive margin this year. That took intense hard work. So I do wanna say that we are grateful for the dollars that came in last year and the budget that we got. It was a specific comment around the budget that we built and how it felt like in front of the public there was a back and forth about what the rate was going to be and how you met in the middle. Thank I understand you. that. I think that's a fair fair observation. As you know, we don't have an option to discuss this uh, with board members outside of public view. Um, but, you know, as I've negotiated a number of things and it seems like it's kind of typical for people to have different views and to kind of coalesce around a particular area, kind of accommodating people's different views. And I imagine that happens with your budget. Uh, Mr. Vincent said there's a number of iterations and you went back and forth, right? I mean, your number, when you give it to us, it's not some sacrosanct thing. You said it's your best guess. So did you have back and forth when you came up with your budget and then kind of all came to an agreement? Yes, I think you're right. Um, but I do think when you look back on the first thing about the 90 million, you have to remember the 90 million isn't just UVMMCs, it's also split between UVMMC and, and CVMC. But when we're trying to make a budget, when we get whatever dollars are given to us, there are things that you're not noticing that are happening behind the scenes that we're not doing in order to get to that point. Yeah. Right. And that's what's really hard um, that that I wish. I mean, so the way that our um, our repairs happen behind the scenes is based on the dollars that are coming in. And so are we going to fix that elevator proactively? Or are we going to wait till it breaks? Do we have enough? We know it's going to break sometime this year. Do we want to wait or do we want to proactively do it? Do we want to go ahead and buy Epic for home health and hospice? Because that would make the ease of care for our patients moving from our hospitals at to, into home health and back so that our the documentation can go flow so seamlessly like the rest of the system. Can we afford to do that or not? So there's a lot of decisions that are happening that are truly for patient care that don't happen when we don't have the dollars. That's the hard part of being able to kind of visually see what's going on. So when you when you say, you know, you didn't get what we we didn't get what we asked for, um, it becomes really tough because when we make decisions that impact patient care, it makes it a lot harder to recruit patient uh, recruit doctors when we have a decreased amount of dollars that are coming in. It's a lot harder to reward doctors for the work that they're doing when we know we can't have enough. That has an impact on the future years. It's all of those things that we're putting into play very transparently. I mean, there, I mean, you see where all the dollars are flowing. That's the challenge that we have. So, you know, you can give us whatever, you know, we ask you for what we really think is a reasonable adjustment for what we need, which has already gone through a bunch of compromises. Lots of people arguing that it should be more. 
Some people arguing that it should be less, just like what you're seeing. And we're thinking about all of those factors when we put it into place. But there's no doubt that if there are changes to what we've asked for, that we make changes in what we can do. It's it's pretty straightforward. It isn't, and it's transparent because everyone can see what we're doing. Totally, totally right. I think that's exactly a great point. I think it's true. If we don't give you as much money, you're going to have to make hard decisions. And that's what we're trying to balance is what are the consequences to that and what are the consequences of giving the increases that are requested. So uh, Dr. Eppen, I think you're spot on. It makes hard decisions and you could do more if you got more. Um, but you, I appreciate your opening remarks about understanding what we're trying to do. Um, just a, a couple quick ones here, and I apologize for to my care board members. We can go late if we need to, but um, on this point of you obtaining more money to to help with access to care, isn't do you think that the high cost of care is a significant barrier to health care? Yes, if care costs less, we could do more. And so is that a situation that we should be considering in connection with this budget, that the high cost of care can be a significant barrier to health care? If you could control the cost of care. So if you could control the biggest part of our cost of care, which is our people, if you could reduce the costs of nurses, if you could reduce the costs of doctors, that would really help us. If you just simply give us less money in that fixed environment, that doesn't help us. Right, but what I'm getting at, so the healthcare advocate talks of sometimes about how we're losing access because people can't afford healthcare. And, you know, that's something, is that something I should be balancing in our budget decisions, that the cost of healthcare is impacting people's access? You want money to improve access, but is there a downside to that of blocking access because of the financial decision? I think that's the balance. That's the delicate balance that we're walking. Um, unless we can figure out a different way of, I mean, and we can we can talk about this. This might be out of scope, but talk about is there a different way that our system can pay for healthcare? Can we use the Vermont provider tax in a different way so that it supports people that are trouble having trouble paying for their insurance? Um, can we use the wealthy folks who don't collect an income but have lots of money? Can we tax their wealth? in a way that would help support the rest of Vermonters who can't afford it. There's lots of different ways to do it. Um, I don't think reducing how much you're uh, paying us is necessarily the way to do it. That's the balance. You can't have all of it. Care costs this much. Lots of it is out of our control. If you reduce how much we get, we reduce how much we can do. I don't, I don't you know, we're trying to be as efficient as possible. We wanna be as efficient as possible when we deliver care. I don't doubt that so, for a second, to, but my point Foster, is just- I'll, I'll just add that right now, we have significant backlogs. People are right now seeking care and paying for it and affording it. And so to this point, what we see right now in Vermont is there are access challenges. We've heard about them before. We came in front of the Green Mountain Care Board in the past around access challenges. And we're doing every single thing in our power to improve access while keeping it as affordable as possible. Some some people are accessing plenty of care. So I want to read you a couple quotes just to set a framework of what I'm seeing here. In 2018, uh, your former CEO said that, quote, the high cost continues to be a significant barrier to health care. This situation is unacceptable. He also said, I see many patients who went without treatment because they simply cannot afford care. That has to change. And it's those points and the fact that that's five years ago and healthcare in Vermont has gone up significantly. If it was unacceptable back then and there are patients avoiding treatment, I think that's something that we should be thinking about. And maybe in your future budgets, we can ask for it in our guidance. But it seems like there is an, if there's an access problem back then that was unacceptable because of cost, there is today too. And I'm just flagging that as something that we have a responsibility as regulators to consider. Um, there are many yeah, people waiting I mean, to get into your hospitals for sure, but there are some people yeah, who are not I, because they can't pay for it. Yeah, I think I think I get hard for me to speak for what John was saying, but I think when we talk about it, when I talk about it on a large scale, um, I would say the same thing. It's a national problem, though, not a local problem. When we talk about that, that we have a issue with the way that healthcare um, is being delivered in America. 
we're doing an, a phenomenal job in Vermont compared to most places. Um, and so I think I think you got to keep it in context of of where we are. And I think you're right. I think there are we know that there are people that don't get the the care that they want or deserve because they can't afford it. But we have an amazing system that delivers care to everyone, and we're committed to doing that equitably. The people that often leave our system because they can't get access to doing it are the people that have a lot of money. Um, they can go out elsewhere to get care. Um, they can pay for it with private practitioners that only take certain insurances, et cetera. We don't do that. Our job is to be a different model um, yeah. of what we're trying to do. So when you reduce, when we have less, Um, executive compensation. Um, I understand that the justification is that they're they're benchmarked, and this is the amount of money that's needed. Um, yes or no? Will you provide the board those benchmarks? Um, I'm trying to remember. I think this is something that we can share. I believe in executive session, but I'll look to I'll look to to Eric and Sunny to. Validate that. Um, as with any data regarding competitively sensitive decisions like how much to pay versus doctors, executives, we can provide you with information regarding the, uh, what is taken account in making those decisions to a degree. And to that degree, we can talk about it in an executive session. Would you provide the benchmarks that were used to set the executive salaries confidentially to us? We can talk about that in an executive session, and I can talk about it with uh, your legal team to ensure that that would be possible. So I don't think whether or not you'll provide the documents is confidential information. So I think you can answer if you'll provide us the documents. We'll talk about it in an executive session and with your counsel. Okay. Well, it's your burden to justify your budget, and I think looking at the benchmarks would uh, assist us in validating um, that. Um, we understand our burden, and we understand the criteria by which the board is required to judge our budgets. Um, in terms of executive compensation, uh, when you have the incentive compensation, does that do you have any uh, review or consideration of um, UVM's ability to control operating expenses. So I'm getting at is the factors that are looked at in terms of setting executive compensation. And maybe this is a question for the chair of the board, um, but do you consider UVM's ability to control its operating expenses in determining whether or not there should be incentive comp awarded? So I, I guess I guess I could probably comment. I don't know if Allie wants to comment or if she was waiting for executive session to comment, but yeah. but I, I well go ahead, Sonny. Yeah, I was gonna say, Owen, that um certainly a biggest part of whether or not executive bonuses get paid is based on whether or not you hit your financial margin. So if you say that it would be virtually impossible for us to hit our financial margins unless we are operating as efficiently as possible. And so in the past number of years, and this will be another year, we will not be able to make a margin. And so the biggest part, and uh, sometimes the only part of the bonuses have not been paid and they will not be paid again this year. So does that answer your question? Yes, is the answer. <laughs> well, kind of. Because okay. you can you can hit your margin if you have extremely high rate increases. I'm talking about operating expenses. Is there like a review of operating? So some of the things we're trying to achieve oh. as a state is affordability, right, and access. And we have we're paying as a system, you know, what what I consider significant sums of money to executives in in healthcare systems and, and at UVM in particular. And we want to ensure we have this stable of thoroughbred talent, right, that we're paying for. 
And is it being properly incentivized to achieve what the state wants? Is there any opportunity to ensure that this team of, of leadership is incentivized in the way that's consistent with what we want as a state, which is lowering costs, improving access, delaying wait, or sorry, improving wait times? Are those things, is there an opportunity there to align the state goals with how the incentive comp is awarded? So we have a complex uh, compensation committee that looks at this, our voluntary board. And I think, again, I'm not sure if Ali's gonna comment now or later on about uh, the process of what they go through. I, I can tell you it's having gone through it once now and seen it, it is rigorous. Um, they really hold the executives accountable. Um, and they're um, about the patient's experience and their accessibility, the the costs. Costs are funny. You can, you know, you have to be careful about what you're going after when you go after costs. You could decrease costs, right? That's why margin is a good number there. Um, but there are many, many of these. Um, so some of the things that we talk about are um, we have tangible measures of the employee experience that we're looking at for this year. And, and that's done by a Gallup survey that's put out. And every executive, every hospital partner, uh, president has a goal that is to improve their employee experience because we know that's going to connect to the way we have access. Patient experience, similarly, every hospital partner, including me, um, has the same thing. Our hospital patient experience has to be improved by a tangible measure as measured by Press Ganey. The margin is a part of that as well. Um, and then every one of the shared services has a benchmark that they have to reach to be able to do it. So for HR, it could be our turnover rate. Is our turnover rate getting better? Are we able to recruit faster? Whatever those, every one of the executives in those areas has a very tangible, specific um, piece. I. I, I don't know, Eric, again, if uh, I'm happy to, at the end so, of our Dr. Comp committee, let me, let me, let me share the for, whole thing with you, Eamon. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to share the whole thing with you if that's okay, yeah. Yeah, just if you can, if you're willing to send it to us, that's great. And I'll just put in a plug that ensuring that alignment is is beneficial and we can, we can move on. Um, I'd heard and read somewhere that UVM executives had taken uh, pay cuts or forgone bonuses or, or some variety of that during COVID. And I was wondering, you know, I get everyone's mission driven and talented and, you know, you have a high market value. I get that. Um, but given the affordability challenges we're having, uh, is that an appropriate thing to happen here uh, this year or next year to, to lower some of these executive costs? And I know that's not going to solve the problem. I know that doesn't solve affordability, but for people paying it, it is hard for them to see these 2,900, you know, those kinds of salaries are very high in Vermont. And I wonder if that's something, you don't have to answer it. I'll just put it out there that perhaps that's something um, that could be considered due to the affordability challenge. I laud you for doing it during COVID and I'll just put a plug in that perhaps that's something that should be visited. I know I'm not trying to take away your money at all. I get it, you worked hard, you're top-notch people, um, but there's a lot of top-notch people working really hard to pay this and it's hard for them to, to see that kind of number. And I'm, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, the only other quick thing, is there was a, a Digger article back in 2017 discussing several private flights that UVM Medical Center had chartered to um, uh, investigate the acquisitions of the New York hospitals. Um, can you tell me when the last time UVM, any UVM entity, the health ventures, the captive, any time a UVM entity uh, last chartered a private flight? Well, I can certainly say that it hasn't happened since I've been here um, that I'm aware of, and certainly I have not been on one. Um, I don't know if anyone else is aware. I, I just encourage anyone to speak freely if if they're aware of it. I'm, I'm not, not aware. aware. Yeah, not aware of any since 17. Definitely none since 19. Since I've been president. Great. Um, and is I'm asking these because of the financial challenges people are having. Um, but is is first class travel permitted for anyone who's traveling is being paid by any UVM entity? I, I can say that I think we have very strict guidelines on it. I think for international travel, um, for business, I think we are allowed uh, business class. If I'm, but uh, I'm not sure if I see some HR person that could. We can give you the, I'm happy to share those regulations with you, Owen, that we have across the network. 
around our travel travel guidelines. It's they're open and transparent and everyone knows about them. Great. Yeah. If you can send them. And again, I'll put in a plug that just for people paying these rates, some austerity measures um, and enforcement of that would be, I think, a good optics and, and helpful for people. Not just good optics. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, given where we are as a healthcare system. And I know you guys recognize that, so so thank you. Um, I have nothing else. Thank you all very much for answering my questions. I apologize for taking so long. Uh, hey, great. Uh, Dave Marmin, I, um, I don't know if anybody needs to take a few minute break. Uh, it's been a while since the last one. I'm okay going on. Uh, Rick, do you need a, anybody? Okay. I just want to pick up a few things with uh, Chair Foster left off with um, regarding executive compensation bonuses. Uh, Dr. Eppen, you mentioned there is a, a margin target that had a large component. It, it, it sounds like you're actually making a margin in FY23 as of now and projected to make one. Is that would, would that not count? No, it, it was a it was a. Correct me again if I'm wrong. I wasn't here when it was done, but you have to make the margin that was actually there for the network um, to hit that target for everyone, and and we will not make it this year. Okay. So we will not hit that target. Okay. It was. Uh, it's not a. If you hit 20% of it, you get 20% of it. You had to hit the margin actually. It's a binary threshold. Okay. Yeah. Um, so just a few. I I had some a bunch of questions that I had sort of wanted to ask you, but then there's a few things that came up which I don't I don't want to like. Um, go go too extensively into, but just a few things, a follow-up question from doc, from Chair Foster regarding the FY23 actuals. When when during the year does the does the rate increase related to the board's order come into effect? So the, the vast majority of the 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 rate increase comes into effect in January. Most of our uh, most of our commercial contracts are January. Um, some of the some of the Medicare rate increases come into effect um, in October, so a small portion um, um, happens there, but the bulk of the rate increases happen uh, on January first. Okay. And if if you were to, and when was the FEMA and GME money? When did that come in? Um, we'll have to get back to you on the exact months, but it was um, so the GME money was definitely in June. Um, that's when the retroactive uh, payment um, was made for last fiscal year. The FEMA dollars, I believe, were in the February March uh, timeframe, somewhere in there. Okay, because looking at January on, and I actually don't have it up in front of me right now. margin each month. Do you know what the margin would be if you just include Yeah, the, there's no doubt that January was the was the turning point. So the the rates taking in uh, coming into effect in January plus all of the the additional work that we've done to improve access, um, reduce costs. Um, one of the things that we highlighted in our um, in our narrative is that we um, we were significantly under budget on administrative shared service costs uh, so far this year, um, somewhere in the twenty million dollar range. Um, so all of those impacts really started to to to, to take place and started to happen in the January uh, time frame. Um, the the actual margin without the FEMA dollars, uh, Dr. Merman will have to. We'll have to we'll have to get back to you. So, Dr. Merman, one thing to take into account is that many of our costs go up October first. So, new contracts for employees, the the union wage changes, uh, cost of living increases, all kick in October first this year as well. And so, you don't cover those those costs until the commercial rate kicks in in January. Same with with 23's budget. Our expenses went up significantly in October 1st of 23, and then when the commercial rate kicked in in January, that helped overcome those cost increases for labor and other issues. Okay, and that's a cycle that occurs yes. annually. Yes. But it it would seem to be more predictive of, of where your revenue would lie, at least, I mean, maybe, maybe margin because of those increased costs would be challenging, but at least revenue to look at once the 
rate increase kicked in in January. So from January to now. We build our rate increase based on nine months of the new rate. That's how we do it. We, and, we build that into the budget. Okay. It, yes, that we built it in, in in kind of a pathway of when we thought dollars were going to come in. Uh, Dr. Merman, in addition, um, you were asking about FEMA dollars and, and certain things that have been one time or initiatives we have taken on. So it's not just been the rate. Um, we also um, impacted our wage index by taking the rural wage index. We applied for self community hospitals. So we have been looking for ways to augment and supplement the the rate increase so it's a number of factors in addition to um, the FEMA as well we've worked very hard on um, applying for every um, opportunity for funding that we could yeah actually that brings up a, a point that Rick uh, Dr. Ben Mr. Benson sorry had mentioned earlier on that I wanted to follow up on sorry um, you had said there was other opportunities to potentially improve governmental reimbursements what are some of those opportunities? Uh, the biggest one is uh, hospital directed payments, which I think we discussed a little bit uh, with uh, the the board last uh, last year during the budget process. Um, what that is is for uh, academic uh, medical centers, uh, similar to the GME um, uh, program, um, to reflect the fact that academic medical centers take care of uh, much more acute patients. Uh, they typically serve as the safety net uh, hospital for their, their region. Uh, Medicare recognize, or Medicaid, if you will, federal Medicaid, if you will, recognizes the fact that, um, that academic medical centers require additional resources. And the, the math behind um, those funds is it takes the hospital very, very kind of high level. There's a lot more detail behind this, but just very, very high level. Takes the Medicaid revenue that you generate on your hospital billings and brings them up to the commercial rates. So it reflects the fact that you need more resources to take care of the patients that you're taking care of, and also the fact that you're you're training uh, future providers that are that will help the the healthcare um, industry to meet the, the access needs, but you need a just like the GME program, you need a you need a partner um, in doing that. Which we obviously have a very good partner um, with UVM to pursue these types of opportunities. So we're still pursuing it, but it hasn't yet. Um, we haven't yet uh, crossed the finish line with that uh, with that pursuit. Okay. Um. I guess this is a, a little bit of a segue from my prior comments, which I just wanted to ask if any of you were able to partake in the series of board meetings we had in the spring on cost shifting. I did not participate. I don't know if anybody else in the call was there. No. So I listened yeah. in on one of them. David, I, yeah. I was yeah. on the uh, gosh, the, the the Medicare rate. I think was it in Montana or Wyoming? I can't remember. That yeah. guy, I, I did listen to his or, or watch. Yeah, Marilyn um, blanking on her last name, who's was wonderful yeah. from Montana. Yeah, Montana. I was wondering if you had any reflections. Uh, her presentation was a little bit less. Uh, specific, I think, on trying to understand the impacts that go, the elements of cost shifting or revenue shifting. But I was wondering if you had any reflections on that and how you approach cost shifting and, and what you learned from that presentation. And I can't um, speak specific. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say, I, I, gotta, I gotta go back and review my notes. I wasn't expecting it, but, um, you know, uh, David, I think just broadly, uh, sorry, didn't mean to cut you off, Rick, and I'll let you answer, but um, just broadly, I think it's really different when you're an organization where the goal is, I want to try to provide equitable, high-quality care to everyone that walks in the door, and that if we see a need, regardless of whether it gets reimbursed, that we want to then provide that care, it's really different when you take when you have that kind of a situation and that kind of a commitment. 
versus, you know, you could have a, an academic medical center that picks and chooses, chooses what they want to do and, and can deliberately make decisions about not covering certain things. And it's subtle. And I'm just going to give you the example, right? Is that if you don't have psychiatrists, you can't provide mental health care. And so you can, you can, and, then, and you know this, you're in the emergency room, you got to take everyone that comes in, but there's no place to put them. And so people realize and learn where they can go and where they can't go to do that when you're in a, um, a system that looks at those kinds of things. We're in a system that our goal is, how do we take care of everyone? How do we take care of the needs of our community? And so we look at it really differently. We look at, we look at it, and we do look at what makes money and what brings dollars in only for the purpose that we can then take those dollars and put it into areas that we know we can't make money yet we have to provide the service. Yes. And so it's a really different way to look at um, how to deliver care. Uh, and so when I, I think when I was listening to the woman from that was talking about Montana, I, I think you have to look at it in the context of all the other hospitals and what were they doing? Um, did they shift the kinds of providers that they had because of what they were going to deliver or not? Uh, when you saw, I saw, the, I think if I remember right, there were like some hospitals that had higher costs, but, but didn't really provide um, information about what they were doing and what they weren't doing and what the kinds of care that they were providing. So it was, it was interesting, but yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to comment down that road. Sorry, Rick, I didn't want to interrupt you. I think what I would say, Dr. Merman is, so again, so I apologize, I didn't participate in that, um, in that session, but I think this is where we've been incredibly transparent with the cost shift um, the last um, many years. We've included in our materials an exhibit for each hospital clearly showing the cost inflation that um, that we're projecting for this current year. From there, we show very clearly the Medicare and Medicaid rate increases uh, that we're projecting and then what the required commercial um, rate needs to be to cover that cost inflation. That I think that level of transparency, um, I, I'm not sure you would find in other regulatory processes, if you will, like 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 we have here in Vermont, that we're very very clear and we show the exact figures and the exact cost cost shift every year when we submit our our, our budgets. So I would say I would encourage you to listen to the especially the other two presentations, although hers was quite interesting um, regarding cost shifting, and they do comment a lot on sort of the concept of cost shifting, which um, some people say the cost shift doesn't exist. I, I don't think that's accurate. I think that what they're trying to say is that the cost shift um, is more of a relationship to market power than it is a necessity that I think an example was used once when there was a cardiac stent that uh, Medicare doesn't cover the increased costs of the cardiac stents. So we shift that cost to commercial payers. And then the, these speakers would argue that the um, that that's because of market power, and that hospitals that don't have market power, and all the hospitals I've ever worked at, Dr. Evan, I've been very fortunate in this. See, everybody who comes through the door and takes care of them, and if they can't, I've been fortunate to work in a place where I can transfer them to a hospital who who is more than willing to to take them, regardless of their ability to pay. But that. These hospitals, uh, some hospitals don't have the market power and thus can't negotiate for high rates. Now we have a different system here in Vermont. Um, and so therefore they are lower costs. Their costs are closer to the Medicare allowable costs, but their quality remains the same. And so I think it actually really speaks to what you guys did last year. You didn't get as much money through the rate as you wanted, you scrambled to find money, you worked really hard to reduce costs. And in the end, you've made a, a 2% margin and done quite well, improving access to care, decreasing reliance on travelers, all the great work that you've done. So it's, I think it's a really interesting concept. I, I would really encourage you to listen through those um, sessions and try to figure out how to think about how to integrate those into your budgetary process and your philosophy as you approach it. Yeah, I think I, uh, just, it's just, a really good point. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. I know. Maybe just to make uh, one comment, I think part of that um, is what 
uh, is what Sonny shared is those organizations may very well be deciding to not hire that psychiatrist, to not keep beds open because they don't have the, the capacity in the post acute system to 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 manage the the flow of patients. So I think the decisions that organizations are making to get to those uh, to get to the financial targets that they need um, if they haven't um, if they haven't been able to truly cover the costs that they're incurring, I think is important to under to understand because I think we've been very clear that we haven't made those uh, we haven't made those choices. Um, and again, we've been very transparent with what uh, with what that that cost shift uh, means for means for us. Sorry, Sonny. Yeah, and I was just going to add just to what Rick was saying before you respond, David. Um, is that so? First of all, the Medicare cost reports. I'd have to really understand like the consistency of how those are reported. Just like we just like we heard about the cost reports, right? If you don't understand what goes into it, is it part of a system? Is it a standalone? Is it a largely Medicare-driven hospital? Um, that that would be a really important thing. The other part is on like things like provider tax. Where does the Medicare dollars go in that particular state? Are they using it comparable to how we're using it? Do provider taxes go right back into taking care of the patients or do they go into housing and, and food food insecurity, et cetera? Those are important. But the other part to remember, I mean, I would just not buy the stent if I couldn't afford it, right? If I thought that was the best stent, but I can't afford it because I'm going to go broke, I'll use the second tier stent to do that. And so it's like those kinds of decisions that are are challenging. And if here's the really big important part, though, if it's you and me, and we know that Dartmouth has a better stent because either the clot rate is lower or the longevity is higher, but we're not using it here, the people that can afford it will go over and get that. And what we're trying to do is it, we don't care who your insurer is. We don't care if you can pay out of pocket or not. We're going to give you the same highest quality scent possible. That's what we want to do. And those yep. are the subtleties that you won't catch in the in the in the differences, right? That we have to be really careful about. I, I would really encourage you to to watch these and, and read the body of literature on this. I, I would say that the the argument that we made by those folks would be that the stent price goes up, Medicare doesn't cover that increased cost of the stent. So now you have a lower margin operation. So the way you manage your lower margin operation could be to increase your volume and you have lower margin per patient, and then you actually increase access and do more. It's it's just an option as opposed to just passing the cost directly on to the, to the commercial insurer. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. We try to do as much volume as we can uh, when we have the need. And so it doesn't work like the, the only way you can drive that is either you have to take the lower margin and we do less of what we don't have a margin on. Um, I, just tell, just imagine if you're the cardiologist and we tell you, listen, we're going to use this new stent. It's great, but you're going to have to do twice as many in the same amount of time. That's how we're going to make up for your, for your margin, for your dollars. Uh, just imagine if you're the doc or whoever you are in that provider. It does, it's a scenario that doesn't work in reality um, unless you're going to compensate people differently for for those kinds of things and we've worked really hard on equity on the comp as you know on the compensation side as well right that's really really important to us yeah i wouldn't want the interventional cardiologist to hunt me down and say you know dr merman just suggested i do twice as many caths per week for the same compensation <laughs> it, it clearly requires up, up staffing and that resource too but I would encourage you to listen through it and look at it. There's a pretty extensive body literature, especially over the last five or six years, that really calls into question the necessity, and it's more uh, more related to market effects. Um, there's one thing I want to talk through. Uh, Sarah, is there a way you can put up page 38 of the narrative? Uh, one it's, moment, please. Yeah, it's the... So it's this analysis on page 37, 38 of the submission discussing this sort of complicated um, financial and quality impacts of the inability to transfer patients to post-acute care or other appropriate care settings. I mean, this is, you know, we've asked all hospitals to submit information on this. Um, this is something that, you know, as a clinician, I've known about for a long period of, of time is this is a, a huge challenge uh, for healthcare organizations to to manage or struggle to manage the impacts of uh, 
transferring patients out of the hospital who need uh, post-acute care. So I just wanted to make sure I understand the this analysis clearly. Um, so it looks to me that what you guys did here, and I'm just gonna, you know, for specific concerns, I'm gonna only look at the UVM MC and discuss the UVM MC component of this. But um, what we have here in the first column is the actual uh, average length of stay, which I assume you use a similar statistical method to the visient of taking, uh, you know, sort of a more more complicated geometric mean or whatnot. But this is the average average length of stay of patients admitted to UVM. And the visient is a matched group. It sounds like they're matched by demographics. They're matched by DRG groups, so meaning they're diagnosis related groups uh, from other organizations throughout the country. I, I would assume peer 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 patients elsewhere. Is that Correct. and so yep. and, and so visient looks at these this peer group and says, okay, well, we, we would expect UVM MC that your your patients would have the same length of stay. And so the next column is your actual daily census. And then and then you come up with an expected daily sentence census by by adjusting for that different length of stay. And then the difference between those two numbers multiplied by the number of days per year, I get I get slightly different than that, but it was close enough that I assume that's where that calculation comes. Gives you a 27,000 roughly uncompensated annual patient days. And then I don't know if I quite understand the adjustment for the non-DRG payment, but, but that's okay for this. It, we, we adjust it um, and we get the adjusted uncomped annual days. And then you have a you have a measurement of your direct cost per day of 2222. And then you end up with $52 million in uncompensated care. And this quantifies the, the, the burden that UVMMC is seeing on this big, big challenge of of it's not just post-acute care, it's, you know, as we've heard from other hospitals, it's it's patients who don't actually even have significant medical need. Uh, so the uh, skilled nursing facility, they don't qualify for skilled nursing facilities. People are talking about paying for hotel rooms, um, apartments, other things. But this is the, the complex reality of, of what we're seeing is, is the real big challenge here. And that costs about $52 million in 2022. Does that seem fairly accurate? It does, and just to, to maybe um, explain a couple of the numbers uh, there, Dr. Merman, that um, may not have made sense. So the fifteen, the fifteen percent adjustment for non-DRG payment, what we're doing there is saying essentially some of those days that exceed the expected length of stay, will we're likely still getting payment on, meaning that care is compensated. Um, yeah. So that's why we're adjusting the numbers down. Um, and that expected length of stay is again. This analysis is not perfect. You know, we had to we had to put something together that um, attempts to get at this. But the expected length of stay is the closest thing that we have to what the DRG um, length of stay would be. Meaning, once you extend beyond that 5.2, you're essentially not getting paid for that uh, for that care. So. Hopefully that helps to tie together a couple of those um, a couple of those variables. Okay, I think I, I, th I appreciate that. I think I understand that. All right, and then so for the sake of the argument, I think you just standardize the average cost per day as the same over the three years. More, more for ease of calculation, there's probably some adjustment to that cost, but for the ease of this calculation and, and to sort of illustrate a point, I think that that was that was equal for those days. And then right. it appears that um, in 2023 was a was a was a harder year even than 2022, um, with 60 million dollars of of almost 60 million dollars of uncomped care off of this model. But the the budget for 2024 uh, looks optimistic um, that uh, you're hoping to save 10 million dollars essentially here uh, in uncompensated care or. I th which I think is essentially due to a reduction in the actual length of stay. Is that where that's coming from? So exactly. Dr. Yeah. So Dr. Merman, we've done a huge, huge project at the medical center, a throughput project, and we've worked with case management, the physicians, we have patient placement rounds, both the medical center and across the network to move people out to more appropriate locations. 
We've had some positive results over the last quarter of this year through great work by the providers and, and teams here, and we project that to continue into 24. What's what's working? Um, I, I would say it's um, better communication between providers, case management, the floor, um, setting a discharge date on the day they show up, and then daily patient placement rounds where the issues are being addressed in real time so it doesn't get to that Friday afternoon when you realize the person doesn't have the wheelchair at home or the one last thing they need to go. So I, I would really say it's better communication and real focus. We put major focus into this this spring as we need it for access. We need those beds that are being taken up by people who don't need to be at the academic medical center for someone else who does. Yep. And is this, this I believe, is ECG, which I thought was a, a nice name being in the medical field of a consulting company, but uh, is this the ECG work that you were referenced in the submission? It, it's both local and ECG work. Yes, we, okay. we've done a lot of work as well. We use their help as well. Okay. And then, and then so, and just to, to sort of discuss this in a little bit more detail. So when patients are having a higher length of stay, it, it leads to other, you know, maybe not downstream, but upstream issues to, to get patients into the hospital. And so, so I, I would assume that higher lengths of stay for inpatient admissions have an impact on uh, Dr. Leffler, your and my uh, specialty of emergency medicine, uh, longer ED length of stay. Is that, is that something you guys have experienced? Without question. So when, when I commented earlier about uh, having five patients per day that we declined in December, those are people that were probably stuck in an ED across the state of Vermont. Now we're down to two. Um, that really is the throughput work. That's having a bed available for those people from across Vermont to come and get the tertiary care they need. Okay. And so are there so are there other factors that you look at in, in this data uh, other than the inability to transfer patients to these settings that are leading to increased lengths of stay compared to the comparison group? So, Dr. Dr. Member, if I if I may. It, yeah. uh, Dave Claus, okay. um, the network chief medical officer. So yes, I mean, an initial analysis showed that that a significant portion of our gap between actual length of stay and expected length of stay was related to uh, poor capa in inadequate capacity in our post-acute settings. However, there was also a significant area for uh, opportunity for improvement in our operations. Uh, Dr. Leffler has spoken about the value and the um, the positive impact that we're already seeing with initiation of patient progression rounds. In addition to that, there were major operational changes taken about on the inpatient floors at UVMMC uh, and uh, to some extent at, at, at other institutions um, in terms of um, going to an, a, a um, a concept of unit-based care, where essentially all the professionals were concentrated geographically in one unit to enhance their ability to function as a cohesive team. And so with those together, we are seeing um, slow but significant improvements in improvement in our in, a, in our actual average length of stay. Okay. So are the are the patients in the both both the actual and the uh the, um, Russ, did you want to say something? Um, I'm very sorry to interrupt. I, Dr. Claus, you weren't on the witness list, and I don't believe I swore you in initially. Um, so I hate to take the time to do this. If you're, we're going to keep the discussion with you as a witness, I, I would like to uh, have you under oath. A absolutely. I, uh, I, I guess I did it without knowing I wasn't on the list before, but I'm happy to. Well, if you if you were sworn in before, then and you took the oath before, that uh, is fine with me. If you just weren't on the list, okay. Okay, so you're you're under oath. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. Okay, so so I guess the question I have is: in, Are all patients in in the actual and expected length of stay are they discharged to skilled nursing facilities or other post acute care settings? So I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, so this this encompasses uh, patients regardless of their uh, regardless of their destination after inpatient care. Okay. So this is this is all all admitted patients. So this at is UVM all admitted compared to peer groups. So okay. 
So there are patients uh, in this in this data set that could have a, a you know a, a have a two day length of stay and go home. That, that is correct. The Visient data will actually decrease uh, will will eliminate uh, a certain percentage uh, the one percent of what they call outliers the one percent in each DRG. Um, that has the highest length of stay. But aside from that, yes, all, all comers and someone who is discharged the same day of admission uh, is assigned a length of stay of one day. Okay. So, th so this data actually doesn't just represent long, like as you, as you said, you, you're working at, you found other operational improvements and efficiencies um, through this process that are not related to uh, skilled nursing facility discharges. So this data actually represents UVM's length of stay over the expected length of stay for all patients. And it could, a lot of that length of stay could be due to things other than the inability to discharge to an acute care setting, post-acute care setting. So yeah, it's, to it's, and total, it's, ripped. it's total uncompensated what, care. Yeah. But we do know, we've done a lot of study here that, um, our observed or expected for routine cases that are going home is better than average. We do better on like, like that's under one observed to expected. And our complex patients that have two or three comorbidities that need nursing home placement are way over observed to expected. So the people that are getting, uh, you know, their, their gallbladder out, Dr. Merman, and then they're supposed to go home in three days are oftentimes going home in two. We have okay. good data on that. Okay. But... Okay. Um, Dr. Merman, add to that um, because I've dug in by service line, et cetera, on um, where we have the actual average length of stay higher than expected. And the way the system calculates is if we've had a patient that's been here for 200 days, let's say, and they get discharged, it goes into that calculation for average length of stay. Um, so I, I want to make sure that we understand that even though the number is higher, we've actually made significant improvement in being able to place some of our longer term patients and that uncompensated care will go up when we discharge that patient because that is when the actual billing will drop through. Okay. I guess I'm just trying to understand uh, this chart and I, and I guess to me, it sounds not exactly what I'm looking for in that it's not defining who are the patients that are hard, who are these, I think you used a term in here, um, hard to discharge patients or patients that need post-acute care or other settings compared to a peer group patients, right? We're not taking a subset of patients that are hard to discharge and comparing them against that other subset of patients that are hard to discharge. We're taking all patients and comparing them to all patients. And in that, we have a pretty heterogeneous a group of patients. So, so when I look at this $52 million of uncomped care, you know, a lot of things could be driving that other than just the inability to discharge a patient to a subacute rehab. It is total patients. It is total uncompensated care. Um, and I think as Dr. Leffler and Dr. Klaus pointed, the, the largest piece of that is the, the inability to, to discharge patients. But if you're looking for another breakdown, um, I don't I don't believe we were asked to, to provide that in the in the narrative, but we're happy to try to, to try to do that for you. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Um, yeah. It indicate the estimated annual expenditures associated with providing care that cannot be reimbursed through the inability to transfer patients to post-acute care or other appropriate care settings. So that would be helpful to get a little bit more clarity to answer that specific question. Because I think that what we're looking at is the, I mean, one, one way one could look at this, and I'm not saying this is exactly right, but you could look at the cost of the increased length of stay throughout the UVM Medical Center and attribute all that cost to difficulty discharging patients, and I don't think you can say that with this data. Um, I would love to read you a public comment that we received earlier this year that kind of relates to some of your, uh, some of what you spoke about, Dr. Leffler, regarding the ability to take patients from other hospitals, and some of what you were talking about, Dr. Claus, about the internal operational efficiencies. So 
I experienced this came in in February. I experienced what seems to be a heart attack on Monday night. I went to the Copley ER on Tuesday after determining that my symptoms of chest pressure needed to get checked out. In the ER at Copley, I was accepted in, U in the UVM system 24 to 48 hours to get in. Almost 48 hours later, I was transferred to UVM to a palatial room in Miller. It is now Saturday. I wasn't able to get my heart catheterization procedure yesterday to, uh, due to other urgent cases that came in, and now I'm not sure if it will happen this weekend or not. I am so frustrated that I got delayed by going to Copley. One doc said I would have been taken care of had I gone straight to UVM, and now I'm so frustrated that I've had to fast for a second day while I wait for the elusive cath lab to determine if they will open today. This has cost me at least two extra days in the hospital. I'm a generally healthy person, so I don't, so I didn't realize how screwed the system is. In business, you sim to make all your interactions with customers to be easy and get them what they need. My experience has been that no one knows when things will ha when things will happen being stable now, and I'm at the bottom of the pile. This is very frustrating. I would suggest if you can't do cath procedures at a local hospital, then don't penalize patients coming in via the system and definitely open the cath lab on the weekend if they get backlogged. I don't, anyways, I don't want to get a nice experience at the hospital. I want to get diagnosed and go home. And so I, to me, this this actually speaks to, to, to both of what you were you're speaking about there, the, the impact on other hospitals having to board patients that need to be transferred, but also that there's opportunity to um, decrease length of stay by improving access to procedures. So Dr. Merman, um, first off, February was right after December when we were delaying a lot of people. That's unfortunate, I hate that. The first thing I look at every single day on the census is how many people we couldn't accept last night. First thing I look at every day because it bothers me. It's part of our mission to accept those patients. Then to keep the cath lab open on weekends, you're an ER doctor and you're aware that we have to have the cath lab ready on the weekends for emergent cases. So we have to call on a team. So every Saturday and Sunday, the cardiologist who's on call has to make the determination if they took a stable patient to the cath lab and then the ER has someone who's highly acute or gets transferred here, that's a real problem. We don't have three teams on on Saturdays. So we try and manage that out, which unfortunately this person is right in everything they said. That means they unfortunately have to wait in our system. Um, we are working on that, but right now we have one team on call for emergency cases. If there is a second one, we do urgently call a second one, but we don't typically have the cath lab running all day Saturday or Sunday with the routine cases to keep the availability open for the emergent ones. I appreciate you, uh, you know, keeping a close eye on this, it does, it's very impactful for the system. And if there's any opportunity to look at surge planning, or, you know, in these time periods where, you know, there's a high demand. Um, just, just, I just wanna make a comment. We could pay a full-time second team to be on and do the routine cases, but that would drive up costs a lot. We have to pay special pay on weekends. We'd have to have an extra cardiologist. It's part of what the whole thing we're talking about here today with cost and access. There's a balance. To this point, we've said we're gonna make people wait over the weekends. We could present a program to the Green Mountain Care Board that would have a second team on and do all those other cases, but that would drive up the expense. So I think that's the balance that all of us are working on today. That's a valid point. I think that, I, I guess I wonder in that situation, and maybe this is a great discussion to have on another time, is if there could be a surge plan to get through backlog and not live in backlog. Um, which I think is your experience through the December, January, February timeframe. We, we've done that for many things. We are doing more cardiac cases during the week, but we haven't done it on weekends, but it's fair, fair point. Okay. But I would really appreciate if you could come up with a little bit closer to what you think is a realistic amount of money for what it's costing UVMMC to take care of patients uh, who are awaiting, you know, who, who have long stays associated with difficulty of accessing post-acute care. I think a lot of these actually, my questions have been addressed by Chair Foster. Um, a few questions have come up uh, through through conversations, um, not today, about the, and, and we discussed it today about UVMMC's unique position of being the state's only academic medical center. Um, so 
what are what are some examples, just from a standpoint of examples, or additional costs that are associated with being an academic medical center? So the the first, you want me to start, Steve? And please, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So the first is definitely the 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 breadth of the services that we that that we offer. So being a ac academic medical center in the tertiary and quaternary. Referral center for a region means that you're offering very expensive um, and highly specialized um, services. So that's certainly one of the uh, one of the impacts that um, uh, that we see from a cost perspective. Um, the other is that we we take all comers. Um, so um, the the acuity of the patients that we see because we are that um, that referral center means that um, that we're we're taking care of much sicker. Uh, patients than what you typically see in other uh, hospital settings. So those are the those are the two biggest um, from my perspective. Uh, Steve and Judy, if you want to add, that'd be that'd be great. Yeah. So um, the first thing I would say is that if you look at all the transfers we take over a year, we lose millions of dollars just on transfers. Other hospitals who find people that are complex and hard to take care of, transfer to them to us. That's actually our mission to take care of them. There are small subpopulations of those patients who come that we actually earn a margin on, but but many we lose money on. We lose significant money on dialysis. And in the state of Vermont, um, subspecialty care, because you need an even number of doctors, you can't have 1.6 pediatric oncologists, we round up and try and cover that. And we still have access challenges with that. So by providing the full breadth of tertiary care for patients in our region, but also our learners, um, there's a lot of cost, carrying cost to all those things and having all those services available in real time for people here. Yeah, I think that was actually, I wasn't expecting you to answer what, it was a tertiary care center, but more of an academic medical center. So what I would say, for, it's a similar answer for, um, we provide many services here to make sure we can attract and train our learners for the future of healthcare. And so um, having uh, Da Vinci robots here, having things like that, that's what our learners need for the future. So they're ready to provide care when they are. Having capacity here to teach people the full spectrum of health care they're going to need to learn um, is expensive to do. There are services we do low numbers of patients on with high quality, but are expensive for the infrastructure for that. And, and I would just say, if, you, if you've ever had a medical student with you, um, it slows you down, right? I mean, so when we schedule medical students, my history of scheduling medical students with their primary care physician is you cut their load in a third to a half so that you can have the medical student um, learning. Residents, not that great an extent, they start slow so that you, when you start, you have to put more effort in. Hopefully by the time they finish, they're actually enhancing your ability to deliver care. But overall, there's a cost associated with that, right? So those are I think those are the, the very tangible costs. And I think Steve gave you the more um, sort of here's what we need to deliver in order to be a good academic medical center. But there's just a very specific tangible cost. Like you're not as productive uh, working with a learner as you are working by yourself. I could set my table a lot faster than working with my three year old. Right. And I actually think that relates all the way back to where we started this morning. It feels like a long time ago around the productivity of our academic physicians in clinic. I think this academic mission part of our, our work pertains to that. And that's why academic clinical targets are lower often. But it also- I would also uh, just add one thing quickly, our, some of our costs, our infrastructure costs, IT, for example, some of the systems we need to do research and clinical trials are higher cost than non-academic medical centers. So do, uh, and there's governmental and other uh, grant revenue to cost, to cover some of the costs of the academic, trying to differentiate academic from tertiary uh, functions, aren't there? Yes, any any type of grants that um, that are taking place, any type of research activity, almost all of that is certainly covered by an external source. Um, but there is um, uh, there is infrastructure costs that um, that 
again, that are borne by the an academic medical center that wouldn't be completely covered. Um, the other component, you know, we were talking about residency programs earlier today. Um, you know, the, the, the residency program at the UVM Medical Center, um, obviously the number of re residents um, outstrips the, re the reimbursement that we get for, um, for that, that, uh, that complement of residents. And I think many, you know, many academic medical centers have, um, have done that. Um, one, um, because again, we're training the future generation of, of providers. Um, so there's definitely, there's definitely infrastructure components to an academic medical center that make them, uh, that make them unique. Are there are there academic functions that are not covered by um, grant revenue, governmental payers, payers, and 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 what is the cost of that? Yeah, I, I, I can't, can't even you can't even separate that. Yeah, not really. I mean, it's yeah, such. It's, yeah, go ahead, it's hard. I mean, if you just look at the salaries, just simply look at the salaries and look at the reimbursement, you won't hit the number. So just start with that. Um, that what you get from Medicare and you compare it to the salaries that we pay, you won't hit the number. And then on top of that, add on the, the sort of administrative load that you have to provide, the teaching opportunities that you have to provide. Um, there's probably somebody that's done that. David, it probably exists. I mean, the ACGME probably has something and um, we could probably dig that up if, that, if that's important there. But, but in overall, if you think about the benefit that we as, an, as a state, in a region get from being an academic medical center, being able to be on the cutting edge on, on much more forward thinking on where we want to go because of that, the opportunity to recruit folks and you know bring them here, get them excited about the organization and the and the area and then keep them here. We've been incredibly successful um, with the recruiting part of that. I think all of that, I mean, you sort of have to balance that for the you know the organization and the state of the value of, of having an academic medical center um, on the academic part of it. So it, I think it's a complex math problem that uh, I think there are probably people on both sides of that argument. I think that, I guess the reason why I'm asking is it kind of speaks to your earlier comments, Dr. Eppin, about the regulator's role in understanding the granularity of an operation that came up with CMI and that, you know, with really high skyrocketing uh, insurance rates and the impact that's making uh, on Vermonters and small businesses and individuals is at what point do we need to think about uh, accountability for the costs of the academic training system compared to the benefits of the academic training system for the state of Vermont and for the people who are now paying those rising costs. And I think it's it's not a it's not a there's not a clear answer. It's not a CMI. It's not a numerical value. Um, but but and, and maybe we need to think about as a state of where the more appropriate funding source is. And maybe that's tax revenue versus uh, high commercial insurance rates for a state where, as 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 you know, Mr. Vincent mentioned, he doesn't have specific measures of Vermont's ability, to, Vermonters' ability to pay for insurance. But our median income is 20, 20 points below the mean. I mean, it's we have very low median incomes as a state. So um, for, and for a lot of people in Vermont who live in Bennington or Brattleboro or White River Junction or St. J, you know, that UVM is not really an available resource for them anyway. So it, 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 it's a bigger societal question to me that it raises than a specific question sure. in this budget hearing. Yeah. Dr. Roman, just a comment. Over the past couple of years, we've accepted many, many more transfers from Southern Vermont because partners around us are full all the time. So we're bringing many more people up here. And we know that about a third of the residents that we graduate stay in Vermont. And I would argue strongly they do go to Brattleboro and Bennington and Manchester and Rutland and do help fill those sites. So in a real shortage of healthcare providers, having an academic medical center, which is training nurses, doctors, nurse practitioners to populate the healthcare system in Vermont, um, that's a huge benefit. I, I and Dr. I Lerman. totally agree with that. I just, I think the complexity is how do you quantify that? And I, we could go on for hours and I think, but I'd love to hear your thoughts, Dr. Sanders. Well, I, quickly, this is building on Dr. Leffler's point. As we've looked the past few years, 
we've seen that more than four out of 10 doctors across the state of Vermont either trained at the Larner College of Medicine or completed residency at UVM Medical Center across primary care and specialties. Yeah. Um, I have one more um, line of questioning that I was thinking about asking about, which is essentially, um, you've, it's been discussed several times if, if the board does not approve your full uh, budget request and the assessment of services is going to need to be performed to figure out, you know, where reductions are going to need to be made. Um, last year it says if we're forced to make reductions, we'll look at service lines that are low volume or do not cover their costs. Um, so in 2023, did you do an assessment of which services would need to be cut and, and what did you find? So. Uh Go ahead, Rick. I think we're going to talk about, I think that's the conversation for the executive session, David, is that rather than talk about that here, um, so we have we have done a, a, a reasonable, not, I wouldn't say thorough, but we've, we've done a look at what we would need to do. So I think that's the part that we're saving for later. But okay. I can tell you in general that every year after we get our rates, we compare our rates to what we budgeted. We figure out what the shortfall is, if there is one, and how we're going to adjust the budget. The budget's a plan for the following year. And in 23, after the rates came in lower, there were some other dollars that were coming that we were unsure of when the budget, we didn't even know about them when the budget was submitted. We were unsure of them at the day of the hearing. And then many of those dollars did come in, which allowed us to provide the services and expand access over 23 through a lot of hard work. Okay. Um, and whatever rate comes in this year, however it comes in, we'll build onto the plan that we have to modify what we do to manage that. Thank you for that. Um, so when you're, I think I'll try to ask questions and if uh, in and around this area that if you feel need to go into executive session, please let me know. But when, when you are evaluating a service for a potential reduction, why is it that some services don't cover their costs? Pretty much all comes down to the reimbursement rate um, on that service. Um, you know, there's some services that we uh, that we provide where the reimbursement uh, psychiatry, for example, is is a is a service that isn't um, that isn't reimbursed at a high enough rate to cover uh, to cover the costs. Um, the what we just talked about the the transfers or the uh, the uncompensated care, which I. I, I, I hear you. We'll, we'll we'll shrink the box in terms of what we're actually looking at, um, but that's another example of uh, of a of a of a lever where um, we don't have we're not getting enough rev revenue to cover the cost of the care that we're providing for a large portion of our inpatient um, staff. So okay, so those, so so uh, and, revenue and there's also does volume, not meet the yep. There's also volume, right? There's certain services that if you had enough volume of that service that you could then, there's an economy of scale that's associated with it. So when you look at the example that you used about if you had enough cath volume, then you could sustainably open up a, a second cath room running all day long because there, you know that there was going to be enough volume to be able to get compensated for that. But if you want to keep it open just for that urgent need, then, then you won't have it. And there are some places we have to do that. So if you run an OB service, you've got to be available 24 seven, regardless of the volume and the cost, the fixed cost of that is really high. If you have enough volume, that's fine. You can do it if you don't, right? So there's both of those. There's the reimbursement piece. There's the volume piece as well. Sorry. And, and, and with and regards to the reimbursement piece, I just want to pick up on the reimbursement piece for a minute. So when you're negotiating with commercial insurance companies, so at the end of the, you get the agreement on care board, gives the budget order, you negotiate with the commercial insurance, uh, say like last year, is this a, like an across the board, even, even increase to reimbursements, or do you have abilities to negotiate specific service line increases up for some, maybe less up for others? So it's not, it's not across the board um, and actually, um, we can have uh, Kelly Lang give you a little bit more detail on exactly how that's done, but even within the individual service uh, lines, we have to, we're keeping an eye on where we need to stay within bounds. Uh, so it's not um, that you can increase a particular service line beyond what the, the, the typical market rate is, but we don't do an across the board. We do look at service by service to allocate that 
uh, that rate increase. So Kelly, I don't you want to add any more. Also, you know, we're um, just service by service and we inpatient, outpatient professional. So again, the different buckets of care based on how the payers reimburse uh, payers having different methodologies. So is there ever a concerted effort to take the essential services of a safety net hospital and negotiate higher reimbursement rates for those comparative to other reimbursement increases? I'd like to discuss the is- of contracting and, sorry, Eric was going to beat me to it. I think this is part of executive session conversation. Yeah. But at a high end, David, I mean, when you think about also that when you open up a particular service, it's not just your commercial payers that are using that service. So there's Medicare and Medicaid that are a majority of that. And 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 the payment system and the vagaries that are associated with what gets reimbursed well and what aren't are largely out of our control. All right. Does that make sense? So like like you can you can go for that all you want, um, but the reality is, is that lots of that is preset and unfortunate in America and the way that we've we've chosen to pay for some things and not chosen to pay for others. Yeah. I, I think I'd like to talk more with you all in executive session about the details of this. Um, I think for now, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass off to to whoever's next. Unfortunately, I don't think. Professor Holmes has been able to join us today, so I think only Tom Walsh has left. Thank you so much. Yeah, so Dr. Merman, I'll um and Tom, I'll um call a lunch break now, just so Cassidy and everyone can have a break. Um, why don't we pinch it to forty-five minutes instead of the full hour, and then we're obviously going to go over. Um, there's going to be healthcare advocate questions and some other things, so everything will get pushed back a bit. And I appreciate everyone understanding that it's a really important decisions and UBM should have the opportunity to address all the board member issues. So thanks for your patience. We'll probably go to maybe six o'clock tonight or something like that. So could be longer, could be less, but thank you for your patience and we'll see you in 45 minutes. Thank you. All right, well, well that's what we'll do. Yes, it's fine. I can wait. I can be patient. Okay, yeah, we'll do one more board member and then um, <clears throat> we'll have public comment after the HDA. Understood. Okay. All right, it looks like everyone is back. Um, so Cassidy, we'll, we'll reconvene the, the hearing and um, I think Tom Walsh, uh, Professor Walsh may have some questions for UVM. Hey, thank you, Chair, and welcome back, everyone. Hope you got to um, step outside. It's a, a beautiful day here in Vermont, and um, thankful for it. Um, you know, I'm I'm not a lawyer, uh, so I don't really have a lot of of, of actual questions. Um, I do think that um, as we started off the hearing with a meeting, we all noted how we share a commitment to de- helping develop an affordable, accessible, high quality healthcare system. Having been a clinician for 20 years and now a professor of health policy and now a board member, um, I also think it's important that we think about evidence-based medicine and how as a clinician, when new evidence emerges, we change. We want the Vermonters should understand that we, we would change our treatment as new evidence came in. As regulators, we should also change as new evidence comes in, and we should be keenly aware of the evidence that's available to us. And so most of what I have um, prepared to talk about has been a look through an evidence-based lens through the submissions we've received about budgets. And so I'd like to start off with utilization. you know, assessing utilization is difficult because we tend to think of all utilization as good, but it's not, right? We'd like increased utilization of effective care, preventative care, primary care, but increased utilization of care that's proven to be ineffective or care that's high cost, unproven quality. Um, those things we want to be more cautious about um, when we're trying to avoid 
to develop an affordable and accessible system. So when we're trying to get a grip on a concept like utilization that's difficult, it can be helpful to have a standard way of using it. And when we have a standard way, like with the Medicare cost report, everybody who fills it out, which is everybody who gets paid by Medicare, follows the same instructions to fill it out. There's some discretion involved with how we do it, but follow the same instruction. And then we can um, look at it the same way. UVM has asked that we use external benchmarks in the past, and now we've started using them. But when the numbers come in a way that you're not quite comfortable with, you want to be seen as different or unique or special or develop your own methods for calculating something like utilization. And we see statements in your the August 17 letter that said using your own methods for calculating utilization. You're, it's actually 50% of what is seen um, in the Medicare cost report. That's not evidence-based. I looked for evidence about your method for calculating. Um, I thought it was kind of a, an interesting idea. I could try with the IRS to say how I calculate my income is actually 50% of what they're saying it is. But it you know, doesn't always work that way. So we're using a standardized way of doing it. And I wanted evidence about how you've used what you've done to calculate it. And you said in the 817 letter to look in your narrative. And when I look in the narrative, <clears throat> A lot of what you've written about utilization goes back to the Dartmouth Atlas, which interests me greatly because I've said before that the Atlas has limitations. I teach people how to use the Atlas as part of uh, my other job. And in your narrative, and when uh, people who are advocating for you call in to the board, it's often said that the Atlas is the gold standard of measuring utilization. That's inaccurate. That's old. In 2015, a new bit of evidence came out that said what the, what the Atlas shows is true for Medicare, but it's not true for patients with commercial insurance. In fact, it can be quite different. You can be a low-cost Medicare facility, but a high-cost commercial facility. And that's what the evidence shows UVM to be. Um, that paper that came out in 2015 is kind of obscure, but it, it ended up in the New York Times. Um, the title of the article was Doubt Cast on Medicare as a Model for Healthcare Reform. Experts were wrong about the best place for better and cheaper care. That study has been followed up over and over and over again including in 2022. The study and all those studies were conducted by the second in our speaker series last spring, which Dr. Merman talked about. I encourage you, just like Dr. Merman did, please, please see those videos. Four speakers, the compelling regulator from Montana, Maryland, was the last. That was the least evidence-based um, presentation. Please watch the first three. Um, <clears throat> so your justification for utilization numbers are kind of home-baked or based on outdated evidence. And I bring that up not to be a not to be mean or not, not to be um, confrontational, but because if we're going to have a conversation about evidence-based regulation and trying to move toward building a healthcare system together, we have to be able to talk about what's current what's and what's not, what's selective and what's holistic. So teaching at Dartmouth, I, I wanna make one ask during this. I wish you'd stop making the erroneous claim that the Atlas is the gold standard. It isn't any longer. I say that as someone who teaches there. I'd like to talk about the RAND data next. Um, the researcher who conducted all of the RAND studies 
on price transparency is Christopher Whaley. He was the third of the fourth speakers we had in the spring. I spoke with him yesterday to make sure that what I'm about to talk about is accurate. Um, <clears throat> he's not a friend, but he's a colleague and he's nice. He'd be available to any of you if you wanted to learn more about the RAND information. In the 817 letter to the board, you used inpatient data to talk about standardized and relative pricing, teaching hospital reimbursement. You went into greater detail about that on pages 15 and 16 of, the, of your narrative. The focus on inpatient standardized pricing being similar at Dartmouth and UVM um, is true, but it's selective, it's cherry picked data because the difference really lies in outpatient care where the outpatient prices at UVM are 52% greater than the prices at Dartmouth. So when we convert those standardized prices to a relative comparison, that's what makes the relative comparison where UVM's prices are so much higher than Medicare. So I want to work through that for a second because the RAND data can be really helpful if we walk through it slowly. It's possible to see how UVM's high outpatient prices create a total facility fee that's very high compared to Medicare and way above what um, state health policy people estimate would be necessary for a hospital to break even, to run, um, not making a big profit, but run. UVM's total facility relative price to Medicare is 319.4% of Medicare reimbursement. Dartmouth's is 176.7%. The break even point, what price would UVM need to charge commercial payers in order to make enough money to keep everything running is estimated to be 173% of Medicare. Dartmouth is 156%. So Dartmouth has a relative, its relative price is 21 points over the break even, while UVM's is 146 points over. And that's driven not by inpatient standardized prices, but by the outpatient standardized prices that are 52% greater and do not show up in any of your submissions. So this is a pattern of saying what you want, standards, benchmarks, transparency, but then when the results are not flattering, telling us we should see things your way based on only the information you choose to share with us. And that information is often outdated and incomplete. We can't build the system that we all agreed is our mission when we're communicating that way. I'd like to next turn to your concerns about the cost report and start with the ratio of admin to clinical. You've explained <clears throat> that the shared services at the medical center that are part of the network inflate that ratio in the cost report. And you rightly show that we could remove that to better understand what's actually happening at the medical center. And when we do that, your ratio drops from 31 to 24%, which is within the benchmark, but on the high end. <clears throat> The point of having shared services is to decrease the expenses at the mothership and the affiliates. But when we look at the ratio of admin to clinical at your, affili at your affiliates, Porter's middle, it's not low, it's middle, and CVMC is still very high. So the shared programs that you're describing do not seem to be I can't find 
evidence of them producing any savings. They're an extra layer on top of the existing infrastructure. It's an added layer of administrative administrators and executives on top of the existing layers that are already at the mothership and the affiliates. That's at a time when we need more care providers. I want to talk for a moment about acuity and costs. Um, Dr. Merman asked some questions about this. I think it's a, it's a tricky thing. Um, you pointed out to us repeatedly that Vermont is the most rural state in the country, and the combination of a critical access hospital and an academic medical facility is rare across the country. The examples that you've provided of the rareness of a critical access hospital and an academic medical center are all urban. You mentioned Boston, you mentioned Chicago, where in one block there can be a critical access hospital and an academic medical center. So while it's true that the combination of critical access and academic medical center is rare across the country, it's not rare in rural settings. Tom, do you mean a safety net hospital, not a critical access hospital? I could be mistaken with that. Correct me, Dave. Um, it's the combination of that we see here. I thought it was critical access and academic medical center. Am I wrong in that, Dr. Merman? I believe UVM is, and Sarah could speak better to this as a sole provider and a self-referred safety net hospital, but not does not have critical access um, okay. reimbursements. So my point, thanks for bringing it up. I'm a little bit nervous and may have misspoke. But my point is that the combination being the facility where everybody goes for their regular care or their routine hospitalizations and an academic medical center, while that may be uncommon when we look across the full country, if we look at just rural settings, it's not that uncommon. So the uniqueness that was being claimed earlier is not as unique in rural settings. The acuity concern conversation today, I, I, I got quite concerned about, not just what I was reading in submissions, right? Because providers always think that they're undercoding. Well, the evidence suggests that as soon as we start using um, electronic means to monitor our coding, we start up coding. And that evidence is found by looking at patients before looking at the looking at the length of stay and the death rates before the new electronic medical record begins and the length of stay and death rates after it begins. Patients appear sicker because of higher intensity coding, but in the, in the record and in the billing, but they don't die any sooner. They don't stay in the hospital any longer. So the upcoding, the, the drive to get to 2.3 so that the cost per adjusted discharge looks better doesn't mean you're accurately capturing what's happening to patients. It's driving revenue. And when we look at things like adjusted discharge <clears throat> across a wide number of facilities, we realize that coding has its ups and downs. Everybody's trying to increase their coding lately. 
But the law of large numbers is that if everybody is doing that and we look at the average of a group as everybody, everybody moves toward more intensity, any one facility's place in that distribution won't really change. The whole distribution shifts. So I think that, that that comes up again and again throughout this report where you're describing being upset about where you are in the distribution and talking about your unique features. Well, each of those facilities there has uniqueness, and that's why we're using averages to smooth that out and look at how you do compared to other similar places. There was a comment made <clears throat> during the um, this morning's material where uh, someone suggested that the board maybe should have been paying more attention to acuity and noticed if the acuity was less than we anticipated. I am trying to bring us as a board to make us more aware of the evidence so we could notice more things like that, right? By comparing what's known about evidence to how hospitals in Vermont are performing. But that question really begged, <laughs> that question begged a follow up is, what else do you all think the board should be paying attention to? Where maybe you're not performing as well, like what else could we be missing? So I don't expect anybody to, to answer that, but it, it's an interesting thing to think of. Um, so <laughs> I'll just, I'll conclude. Because <laughs> we're beginning to use standardized benchmarks in our deliberations as you've wanted as we need to, to do evidence-based regulation. I believe that we all want evidence-based care, evidence-based regulation, and to understand how to best use the data to improve access, affordability, and quality, and the financial positions of the hospitals in our state. But when you're submitting selective information that's out of date or incomplete, to fight data that shows where you could improve, that makes it difficult to further this mission. I wanted to say these things in public, have them on the record. I don't really like doing it this way, but it's important that this be said publicly so that we can deliberate together to make the system that we want. <clears throat> Looking at my notes, one more thing, um, one more topic that Dr. Merman brought up um, that I hadn't written down in, before he spoke. Um, I want to comment really quickly on uh, what's known as price discrimination and used to be thought of as the cost shift. We had four guest speakers last spring. The first conducted a study, uh, Dr. Stenslin, Jeffrey Stenslin, conducted a study in 2010. Small group of hospitals showed hospitals don't have to cost shift. Hospitals that have the market power to tolerate commanding higher commercial prices do that. Hospitals without enough market power actually cut their prices to Medicare or lower to stay competitive when they're in competitive markets. That study turned our ideas about cost shift on its head. It was very controversial, but it's been repeated now with more hospitals in different settings and by different researchers. Until in 2017, the study was redone with every hospital, including all of Vermont's. 
hospitals that have the market power to raise prices far above what Medicare pays do so. They're not compelled to, they choose to because they have market power. Hospitals without the market power do not raise their prices similarly. Hospitals that are able to command higher prices, that money shows up in growing infrastructure, expanding administrative roles, and higher than average executive salaries. We've seen that evidence across the country. We used the Medicare cost report to look to see if that was true in Vermont. And it is. So I encourage you to watch those videos. The first three are the most important and to understand price discrimination and the choices that are available to you. And I'll conclude there, unless I left anything off, Dr. Merman, please let me, let me know. But I'll turn it back um, to Chair Foster. Um, one quick follow-up I had, um, and maybe Mr. Vincent, you're the right person, but I'm not sure. Um, the CMI work that's underway, will that have any impact on MA plans? It tends to. It, it tends to be the business model for MA plans to raise the acuity of, to use coding to raise the apparent acuity of patients to get higher reimbursements for those patients who, when compared to patients who are in regular Medicare, they have uh, similar lengths of stay, similar death rates. Patients with MA plans uh, get a bigger uh, reimbursement because they've been coded as sicker. Uh, there's a terrific study looking at patients who moved across the country, moved to different places in the country that, that really goes into great detail about that. So yes, it does affect MA plans substantially. So, so yeah, I'm aware of some of the litigation nationwide against MA plans for this, going through the record to find additional diagnoses um, that you know DOJ has been pursuing, and I just wasn't totally understanding whether or not this project, not that it's like nefarious, but I'm just asking, even if it's like appropriate, would this have an impact on uh, MA plans? So where you're seeing those yes. those cases. So where you're seeing those cases is really on the outpatient services, uh, Chair Foster. So there's another type of acuity coding called HCC coding, so hierarchical category coding. Um, that's where you've seen the MA, the MA um, plans really try to push the acuity of uh, of the of the patients. Um, to be clear, again, what we're basing our CMI work on is that we know um, that we've looked at our documentation and coding, and we've looked at what's happened to the patients, and we're not accurately doing it. So we feel so can, very. Can, can, let me let me cut you off because I think I asked it poorly. I'm not. I'm going to assume that the CMI work you're doing is going to 100% get everything right. Okay, that you're going to just get paid what you should get paid. That's my presumption, and I'm sure that's what we all want. If it does that, and it does it correctly, and bumps it to 2.3 appropriately, what impact will it have on MA plans, if any? So it'll impact uh, any um, any Medicare patient. So if the, if we do have a an, an Medicare MA plan, that will impact the the, the revenue there as well. So I'm wondering, Chair uh, Foster, do you mind if we comment on just a few of the the points that were that were raised by um, uh, by Tom Walsh? If you'd like to, um, I don't have any objection to that. If you want to save it and send it to us in a letter, that's fine for time. If you want to do it now, totally fine. Your your pick. Yeah, I think with all of our team here, I think it would be good just to maybe hit on a, a couple of the uh, a couple of the points. So first of all, to start, we we absolutely appreciate 
the metric driven process that we have this year that's been a major improvement in the process. We're not upset with the results. Um, actually, had the had the tool been presented to us earlier in the year where we could have actually re reviewed the data that's in the tool, we could have had a great dialogue about RAND studies, Vizient data, rating agency reports. Um, there's no perfect benchmark. Um, and so what we're striving for here is is truly a dialogue. So the letters that we're sending to you, um, the the way that we're looking at the data is not because we're upset. It's because we haven't had really any type of chance to really talk about the the metrics that are used in in this year's uh, budget process. It was certainly in the guidance where we had a, a list of the things that um, um, that could potentially be used for the budget. But we certainly didn't have access to be able to see the data and be able to dig in to to see exactly how this um, how this looks. So, I'm we're certainly open to a dialogue, and that's why I said in my opening remarks that I really appreciate the the start that we have here. But we definitely need uh, we definitely need some more work just to to get on the same page in terms of what the um, what the, the appropriate benchmarks are. In terms of the comment of the utilization, um, you know, that is the you know that is the holy grail. You know, trying to decipher between what's bad utilization and what's good utilization. Are we doing things unnecessarily for patients that you know are we ordering lab tests and X-rays that we don't need to to be ordering uh, versus good quality evidence-based care um, that's driven by protocols? That's that's the that. We absolutely have that same uh, that same goal, and I think for us as an organization, we've been on that path with many many programs throughout the year uh, throughout the years. Whether it's choosing wisely, the fact that we're in value based um, programs that looks to 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 impact the cost of care and the and the utilization of services, I think um, you know we're we're definitely we're definitely all on board with that. In terms of the benchmarks that help to cut to drive at that, that's why we've used the Dartmouth Atlas, um, realizing that the data is um, is dated yet and it does get updated, is that does remove some of the noise out of the system and looks at just there's no payment variation, there's no other external facts that that cloud the the amount of utilization per per Medicare beneficiary. And so that is why we keep referring back to that. We're trying to get at that uh, that question, what is bad utilization and what is good utilization? That is how we're using that data is to say that we're only doing what's absolutely necessary for the patients that um, that we're caring for. In terms of the the fifty percent utilization, um, um, comment the point that we were trying to make there is again um, we don't have perfect data but when we're looking at our utilization over a period of time there is some of our volume that comes just purely from taking care of more patients um, it's not doing more with our existing patient uh, base but it's just a growth in the population and we're taking care of more uh, of more people the um, administrative uh, costs. I just want to just want to touch on that briefly. The the point that we were trying to make there in the letter that we that we sent is administrative shared services. So HR, all of us, um, um, UVM Health Network um, leaders here on the on the screen, IT uh, revenue cycle. That's administrative shared services, and we do have benchmarks that look at that. In the tool, again, some a discussion that we certainly could have had because there's you know there's other ways to look at this. The tool is looking at general and administrative salaries as a comparison to clinical salaries. So that general and administrative category includes essentially everybody that isn't clinical. So it includes the housekeepers, it includes facilities, personnel, it includes everybody that is that you wouldn't consider a administrative shared service that is supporting the, the network. So that's the that's the point we were trying to to kind of highlight in the letter that um, 
um, that we sent. Um, and then finally, I think there is a lot of work we can do with the RAN uh, data. We, you know, we have some ex some internal expertise that I think together with the board staff, we can we can get to um, uh, to a better place of understanding the how we may be different, how we may not be different. Um, but I guess I'll just close in saying that no benchmark data is perfect. Um, we're not upset with. Um, uh, the, the the benchmarks that are being used. I think with more time we can get to a better place. And that was the whole point of the letter that we that we sent to you was just to kind of highlight and clarify where a benchmark uh, may not be perfect and we still have some some more work to do. Yeah, thank you for those thoughts, Mr. Vincent. Um, I agree. Uh, this benchmarking tools really helped us and your letter helped us think about your perspective on those data points. And so that was valuable for us in evaluating it also. Thanks for putting the time in to do it. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate for any questions they may have. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I have we'll do, a- We'll do public comment after just for, I know folks are waiting, but sorry to interrupt, Mike. Yep. Um, I have a few questions and uh, Sam Price from my team will have a few questions. Uh, so first off, thank you. <laughs> been a, uh, a long day already and promises to be even longer. Um, and also, thank you. I, I, I should pause for a minute and, and, and express a thank you through you to all of the vast number of providers under you who are providing care. I think I, think I, know, I know others feel the same. You know, we, we have challenging questions at times, um, but that doesn't uh, mean that we don't appreciate the, the work that is represented here. Um, so first off, I have a question about your um, Part C partnership with MVP, and as I launch into it, I'm sure I trust you will alert me if I stray into questions that should be answered in a confidential setting. Um, in answer to a question that was asked by the board um, uh, about the UVM um, MVP partnership, um, you answered that UVM does not currently have an ownership interest in the MVP Part C plan. And so I, I guess I wanted to ask maybe maybe in follow up to that. So are you saying that um, if this plan does well and is profitable, that that will have no impact on UVM's bottom line? That's correct. Uh, right now we have a co-branded product in the market, um, but MVP is solely responsible for the performance uh, of that plan. Uh, we don't have any connection uh, to the financial uh, performance of the, the UVM Health Network uh, Advantage plan. Okay. Um, I was going to, maybe I'll ask it anyway. I, I, I had a sort of a version of the case mix que question for Part C versus, uh, there's been quite, a, quite a lot of questions already about case mix. Um, but I guess I wondered whether you have an analysis of your case mix for, um, even though you don't have an ownership interest, um, for the Part C plan in comparison to other Medicare. Sorry, no, we don't. Uh, we don't have that comparison. Okay. Um, while I'm talking about Medicare uh, and Medicare costs, I, I do want to just pause for a second. This is a comment more than anything. Whenever I hear um, people talk about Vermont being a low-cost Medicare state uh, and referencing the Medicare benchmark data, um, I believe we're talking here about traditional Medicare. And um, and I just think it's it's really important for us all to remember that at least up until recently, Vermont has had a low uptick in Part C. Um, and I think there's been a lot of analysis that uh, um, Part C plans tend to take lower acuity, lower cost people out of the marketplace, out of the, the rest of the traditional group. So states with a lower uptick of Part C um, often uh, will look um, like they cost less. Been some 
a lot of analysis on that, and I could certainly point you to it. There was, there was one it actually done in state as part of the Act 99 report recently. Um, um, it, so follow up on Member Merman's question about the medical school. Um, in addition to the, the costs that he explored in his questioning, um, I also see, or well, I think it's in addition, if you could clarify, I also see in your audited financials uh, what appears to be a transfer to the medical school annually of you know, in the range of 20 to $30 million. Is that in addition to the dynamics that Member Merman explored? No, the transfers that we um, that are that are going to UVM are to pay for specific um, costs. So some of that cost is the the cost of physician salaries. That um, a portion of their salary is is at UVM, but for that time they're actually providing clinical care. Um, so UVM is reimbursed for that that piece of the salary. Some of that is benefits um, with our physicians. They essentially have a choice where they get their benefits, the ones that are duly um, employed by UVM and the UVM Medical Group. They can choose to get their benefits through UVM or they can choose to get their benefits through uh, the UVM Medical Group. Um, so that cost is part of that, uh, that transfer. Plus we do have some space that, um, that we occupy uh, at UVM. So the transfers are all connected to a um, uh, an actual operating expense that we should be paying for as a as an academic medical center. Okay, um, I I will leave that topic with the with you know. Hey, by the way, no one's questioning the importance of the medical school here. I think the the question really should be what's the right way to fund it. And um, and so I I think that it would be an interesting question to evaluate whether other states have found other ways to fund it other than through ratepayer. Dollars. Uh, that's the place where I find the need to push back as to whether the ratepayers is the right way to fund uh, that part of the medical school. Um, um, I, in follow up to Mr. Vincent's earlier comments about the um, uh, bond rating, uh, about your rating, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your uh, about the obligated group. Uh, it was curious for me to understand that uh, the entity that is rated here is 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 not the whole UVM Health Network. It is less maybe Porter and Alice Hyde and a couple of other small entities. Can you explain why that is? It's just based on history, um, and actually on October first of this year, uh, those groups will also those two hospitals will also be in the obligated group. Uh, but to be clear, the rating agencies have always looked at us as a health network. Uh, the obligated group to them doesn't doesn't matter um, when they're looking at financial performance. They're looking at our, uh, and they have been looking at our entire health network. Okay, that's interesting to me. I thought I, I was understanding that um, that the, that the rating was was only on the entities in the obligated group. You're saying it's everyone. It's everyone. Okay. Yep. Um, so, um, I want to note that it's similar to my comment about, or my question about the uh, medical school, I want to focus on the cost of the health systems across the lake. Um, and, and similar, similarly, I'm not questioning whether those hospitals should be supported and, and really meaning to ask, is it Vermont ratepayer dollars that should be supporting them? Um, and, you know, I recognize from their audited financials that um, and talked about. I encourage you, just like Dr. Merma did, please, please see those videos. Four speakers, the compelling regulator from Montana, Maryland, was the last. That was the least evidence-based um, presentation. Please watch the first three. Um, <clears throat> So your justification for utilization numbers are kind of home-baked or based on outdated evidence. And I bring that up not to be a not to be mean or not, not to be 
um, confrontational. But because if we're going to have a conversation about evidence-based regulation and trying to move toward building a healthcare system together, we have to be able to talk about what's current, what's and what's not, what's selective and what's holistic. So teaching at Dartmouth, I, I wanna make one ask during this. I wish you'd stop making the erroneous claim that the Atlas is the gold standard. It isn't any longer. I say that as someone who teaches there. I'd like to talk about the RAND data next. Um, the researcher who conducted all of the RAND studies on price transparency is Christopher Whaley. He was the third of the fourth speakers we had in the spring. I spoke with him yesterday to make sure that what I'm about to talk about is accurate. Um, <clears throat> he's not a friend, but he's a colleague. And he's nice. He'd be available to any of you if you wanted to learn more about the RAND information. In the 817 letter to the board, you used inpatient data to talk about standardized and relative pricing, teaching hospital reimbursement. You went into greater detail about that on pages 15 and 16 of, the, of your narrative. The focus on inpatient standardized pricing being similar at Dartmouth and UVM um, is true, but it's selective, it's cherry picked data because the difference really lies in outpatient care where the outpatient prices at UVM are 52% greater than the prices at Dartmouth. So when we convert those standardized prices to a relative comparison, that's what makes the relative comparison where UVM's prices are so much higher than Medicare. So I wanna work through that for a second because the RAND data can be really helpful if we walk through it slowly. It's possible to see how UVM's high outpatient prices create a total facility fee that's very high compared to Medicare and way above what um, state health policy people estimate would be necessary for a hospital to break even, to run, um, not making a big profit, but run. UVM's total facility relative price to Medicare is 319.4% of Medicare reimbursement. Dartmouth's is 176.7%. The break even point, what price would UVM need to charge commercial payers in order to make enough money to keep everything running is estimated to be 173% of Medicare. Dartmouth is 156%. So Dartmouth has a relative, its relative price is 21 points over the break even, while UVM's is 146 points over. And that's driven not by inpatient standardized prices, but by the outpatient standardized prices that are 52% greater and do not show up in any of your submissions. So this is a pattern of saying what you want, standards, benchmarks, transparency, but then when the results are not flattering, telling us we should see things your way based on only the information you choose to share with us. And that information is often outdated and incomplete. We can't build the system that we all agreed is our mission when we're communicating that way. I'd like to next turn to your concerns about the cost report and start with the ratio of admin to clinical. You've explained <clears throat> that the shared services at the medical center 
that are part of the network inflate that ratio in the cost report. And you rightly show that we could remove that to better understand what's actually happening at the medical center. And when we do that, your ratio drops from 31 to 24%, which is within the benchmark, but on the high end. <clears throat> the point of having shared services is to decrease the expenses at the mothership and the affiliates. But when we look at the ratio of admin to clinical at your, affili at your affiliates, Porter's middle, it's not low, it's middle, and CVMC is still very high. So the shared programs that you're describing do not seem to be, I can't find evidence of them producing any savings. They're an extra layer on top of the existing infrastructure. It's an added layer of administrative <laughs> administrators and executives on top of the existing layers that are already at the mothership and the affiliates. That's at a time when we need more care providers. I want to talk for a moment about acuity and costs. Um, Dr. Merman asked some questions about this. I think it's a, it's a tricky thing. Um, you pointed out to us repeatedly that Vermont is the most rural state in the country, and the combination of a critical access hospital and an academic medical facility is rare across the country. The examples that you've provided of the rareness of a critical access hospital and an academic medical center are all urban. You mentioned Boston, you mentioned Chicago, where in one block there can be a critical access hospital and an academic medical center. So while it's true that the combination of critical access and academic medical center is rare across the country, it's not rare in rural settings. Tom, do you mean a safety net hospital, not a critical access hospital? I could be mistaken with that. Correct me, Dave. Um, it's the combination of that we see here. I thought it was critical access and academic medical center. Am I wrong in that, Dr. Merman? I believe UVM is, and Sarah could speak better to this as a sole provider and a <laughs> self referred safety net hospital, but not does not have critical access um, okay. reimbursements. So my point, thanks for bringing it up. I'm a little bit nervous and may have misspoke. But my point is that the combination being the facility where everybody goes for their regular care or their routine hospitalizations and an academic medical center, while that may be uncommon when we look across the full country, if we look at just rural settings, it's not that uncommon. So the uniqueness that was being claimed earlier is not as unique in rural settings. The acuity concern conversation today, I, I, I got quite concerned about, not just what I was reading in submissions, right? Because providers always think that they're undercoding. Well, the evidence suggests that as soon as we start using um, electronic means to monitor our coding, we start up coding. And that evidence is found by looking at patients before looking at the looking at the length of stay and the death rates before the new electronic medical record begins, and the length of stay and death rates after it begins. Patients appear sicker 
because of higher intensity coding. But in the, in the record and in the billing, but they don't die any sooner. They don't stay in the hospital any longer. So the upcoding, the, the drive to get to 2.3 so that the cost per adjusted discharge looks better doesn't mean you're accurately capturing what's happening to patients. It's driving revenue. And when we look at things like adjusted discharge <clears throat> across a wide number of facilities, we realize that coding has its ups and downs. Everybody's trying to increase their coding lately. But the law of large numbers is that if everybody's doing that and we look at the average of a group, as everybody, everybody moves toward more intensity, any one facility's place in that distribution won't really change. The whole distribution shifts. So I think that that, that comes up again and again throughout this report where you're describing being upset about where you are in the distribution and talking about your unique features. Well, each of those facilities there has uniqueness. And that's why we're using averages to smooth that out and look at how you do compared to other similar places. There was a comment made <clears throat> during the um, this morning's material where uh, someone suggested that the board maybe should have been paying more attention to acuity and noticed if the acuity was less than we anticipated. I am trying to bring us as a board to make us more aware of the evidence so we could notice more things like that, right? By comparing what's known about evidence to how hospitals in Vermont are performing. But that question really begged, <laughs> that question begged a follow-up is, what else do you all think the board should be paying attention to? Where maybe you're not performing as well, like what else could we be missing? So I don't expect anybody to, to answer that, but it, it's an interesting thing to think of. Um, so <laughs> I'll just, I'll conclude. Because we're beginning to use standardized benchmarks in our deliberations as you've wanted as we need to, to do evidence-based regulation. I believe that we all want evidence-based care, evidence-based regulation, and to understand how to best use the data to improve access, affordability, and quality, and the financial positions of the hospitals in our state. But when you're submitting selective information that's out of date or incomplete, to fight data that shows where you could improve, that makes it difficult to further this mission. I wanted to say these things in public, have them on the record. I don't really like doing it this way, but it's important that this be said publicly so that we can deliberate together to make the system that we want. <clears throat> I'm looking at my notes. One more thing, um, one more topic that Dr. Merman brought up um, that I hadn't written down in, before he spoke. Um, I want to comment really quickly on uh, what's known as price discrimination and used to be thought of as the cost shift. We had four guest speakers last spring. The first conducted a study, uh, Dr. Stenslin, Jeffrey Stenslin, conducted a study in 2010 
small group of hospitals showed hospitals don't have to cost shift. Hospitals that have the market power to tolerate commanding higher commercial prices do that. Hospitals without enough market power actually cut their prices to Medicare or lower to stay competitive when they're in competitive markets. That study turned our ideas about cost shift on its head. It was very controversial, but it's been repeated now with more hospitals in different settings and by different researchers. Until in 2017, the study was redone with every hospital, including all of Vermont's. Hospitals that have the market power to raise prices far above what Medicare pays do so. They're not compelled to, they choose to because they have market power. Hospitals without the market power do not raise their prices similarly. Hospitals that are able to command higher prices, that money shows up in growing infrastructure, expanding administrative roles, and higher than average executive salaries. We've seen that evidence across the country. We use the Medicare cost report to look to see if that was true in Vermont. And it is. So I encourage you to watch those videos. The first three are the most important. And to understand price discrimination and the choices that are available to you. And I'll conclude there, unless I left anything off, Dr. Merman, please. Let me let me know, but I'll turn it back um, to Chair Foster. Um, one quick follow up I had, um, and maybe Mr. Vincent, you're the right person, but I'm not sure. Um, the CMI work that's underway, will that have any impact on MA plans? It tends to. <laughs> it it tends to be the business model for MA plans to raise the acuity of, to use coding to raise the apparent acuity of patients to get higher reimbursements for those patients who, when compared to patients who are in regular Medicare, they have uh, similar lengths of stay, similar death rates, patients with MA plans, uh, get a bigger uh, reimbursement because they've been coded as sicker. Uh, there's a terrific study looking at patients who moved across the country, moved to different places in the country that, that really goes into great detail about that. So yes, it does affect MA plans substantially. So, so yeah, I'm aware of some of the litigation nationwide against MA plans for this, going through the record to find additional diagnoses um, that you know DOJ has been pursuing. And I just wasn't totally understanding whether or not this project, not that it's like nefarious, but I'm just asking, even if it's like appropriate, would this have an impact on uh, MA plans? So, so where you're seeing those yes. those cases, so where you're seeing those cases is really on the outpatient services, uh, Chair Foster. So. There's another type of acuity coding called HCC coding, so hierarchical category coding. Um, that's where you've seen the MA, the MA um, plans really try to push the acuity of uh, of the of the patients. Um, to be clear, again, what we're basing our CMI work on is that we know um, that we've looked at our documentation and coding, and we've looked at what's happened to the patients and we're not accurately doing it. So we feel so can, very- can, can, let, me, let me cut you off, because I think I asked it poorly. I'm not, I'm gonna assume that the CMI work you're doing is going to 100% get everything right, okay? That you're gonna just get paid what you should get paid. That's my presumption. 
and I'm sure that's what we all want. If it does that, it does it correctly and bumps it to 2.3 appropriately, what impact will it have on MA plans, if any? So it'll impact uh, any um, any Medicare patient. So if the, if we do have a an, an Medicare MA plan, that will impact the, the the revenue there as well. Okay. So I'm wondering, Chair uh, Foster, do you mind if we comment on just a few of the the points that were that were raised by um, uh, by Tom Walsh? If you'd like to, um, I don't have any objection to that. If you want to save it and send it to us in a letter, that's fine for time. If you want to do it now, totally fine. Your, your pick. Yeah, I think with all of our team here, I think it would be good just to maybe hit on a, a couple of the uh, a couple of the points. So first of all, to start, we we absolutely appreciate the metric driven process that we have this year. That's been a major improvement in the process. We're not upset with the results. Um, actually, had the had the tool been presented to us earlier in the year where we could have actually re reviewed the data that's in the tool, we could have had a great dialogue about RAND studies, Vizient data, rating agency reports. Um, there's no perfect benchmark. Um, and so what we're striving for here is is truly a dialogue. So the letters that we're sending to you, um, the the way that we're looking at the data is not because we're upset. It's because we haven't had really any type of chance to really talk about the the metrics that are used in in this year's um, budget process. It was certainly in the guidance where we had a, a list of the things that um, um, that could potentially be used for the budget. But we certainly didn't have access to be able to see the data and be able to dig in to to see exactly how this um, how this looks. So, I'm we're certainly open to a dialogue, and that's why I said in my opening remarks that I really appreciate the the start that we have here. But we definitely need uh, we definitely need some more work just to to get on the same page in terms of what the um, what the the appropriate benchmarks are. In terms of the comment of the utilization, um, you, that is the you know that is the holy grail. You know, trying to decipher between what's bad utilization and what's good utilization. Are we doing things unnecessarily for patients that you know? Are we ordering lab tests and X-rays that we don't need to to be ordering uh, versus good quality evidence-based care um, that's driven by protocols? That's that's the that. We absolutely have that same uh, that same goal, and I think for us as an organization, we've been on that path with many many programs throughout the year uh, throughout the years. Whether it's choosing wisely, the fact that we're in value based um, programs that looks to 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 impact the cost of care and the and the utilization of services, I think um, you know we're we're definitely we're definitely all on board with that. In terms of the benchmarks that help to cut to drive at that, that's why we've used the Dartmouth Atlas, um, realizing that the data is um, is dated yet and it does get updated, is that does remove some of the noise out of the system and looks at just there's no payment variation, there's no other external facts that that cloud the the amount of utilization per per Medicare beneficiary, and so that is why we keep referring back to that. We're trying to get at that uh, that question: what is bad utilization and what is good utilization? That is how we're using that data: is to say that we're only doing what's absolutely necessary for the patients that um, that we're caring for. In terms of the the fifty percent utilization. Uh, um, comment. The point that we were trying to make there is again, um, we don't have perfect data, but when we're looking at our utilization over a period of time, there is some of our volume that comes just purely from taking care of more patients. Um, it's not doing more with our existing patient uh, base, but it's just a growth in the population and we're taking care of more uh, of more people. The um, administrative uh, costs. I just want to just want to touch on that briefly. The the point that we were trying to make there in the letter that we that we sent is 
administrative shared services, so HR, all of us, um, um, UVM Health Network um, leaders here on the on the screen, IT uh, revenue cycle, that's administrative shared services, and we do have benchmarks that look at that. In the tool, again, some a discussion that we certainly could have had because there's you know there's other ways to look at this. The tool is looking at general and administrative salaries as a comparison to clinical salaries. So that general and administrative category includes essentially everybody that isn't clinical. So it includes the housekeepers, it includes facilities, personnel, it includes everybody that is that you wouldn't consider a administrative shared service that is supporting the, the network. So that's the that's the point we were trying to to kind of highlight in the letter that um, uh, that we sent. Um, and then finally, I think there is a lot of work we can do with the RAN uh, data. We you know we have some ex some internal expertise that I think together with the board staff we can we can get to um, uh, to a better place of understanding the how we may be different, how we may not be different. Um, but I guess I'll just close in saying that. No benchmark data is perfect. Um, we're not upset with um, uh, the, the the benchmarks that are being used. I think with more time, we can get to a better place. And that was the whole point of the letter that we that we sent to you was just to kind of highlight and clarify where a benchmark uh, may not be perfect, and we still have some some more work to do. Yeah, thank you for those thoughts, Mr. Vincent. Um, I agree. Uh, benchmarking tools really helped us, and your letter helped us think about your perspective on those data points. And so that was valuable for us in evaluating it. Also, thanks for putting the time in to do it. Um, I'll turn to the healthcare advocate for any questions they may have. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, I have. Yeah, we'll do. A... We'll do public comment after, just for. I know folks are waiting, but sorry to interrupt, Mike. Yep. Um, I have a few questions, and uh, Sam Price from my team will have a few questions. Uh, so first off, thank you. Um, been a uh, a long day already, and promises to be even longer. Um, and also, thank you. I, I I should pause for a minute and 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 express a thank you through you to all of the vast number of providers under you who are providing care. I think I think I know I know others feel the same. You know we. We have challenging questions at times, um, but that doesn't uh, mean that we don't appreciate the the work that is represented here. Um, so first off, I have a question about your um, Part C partnership with MVP. And as I launch into it, I'm sure I trust you will alert me if I stray into questions that should be answered in a confidential setting. Um, in answer to a question that was asked by the board um, uh, about the UVM um, MVP partnership, um, you answered that UVM does not currently have an ownership interest in the MVP Part C plan. And so I, I guess I wanted to ask maybe, maybe in follow up to that. So are you saying that? Um, if this plan does well and is profitable, that that will have no impact on UVM's bottom line? That's correct. Uh, right now we have a co-branded product in the market, um, but MVP is solely responsible for the performance uh, of that plan. Uh, we don't have any connection uh, to the financial uh, performance of the, the UVM Health Network. Uh, advantage plan. Okay. Um, I was going to, maybe I'll ask it anyway. I, I, I had a sort of a version of the case mix que question for Part C versus, uh, there's been quite, a, quite a lot of questions already about case mix, um, but I guess I wondered whether you have an analysis of your case mix for, um, even though you don't have an ownership interest, um, for the Part C plan in comparison to other Medicare. Sorry, no, we don't. Uh, we don't have that comparison. Okay. Um, 
while I'm talking about Medicare uh, and Medicare costs, I, I do want to just pause for a second. This is a comment more than anything. Whenever I hear um, people talk about Vermont being a low-cost Medicare state uh, and referencing the Medicare benchmark data, um, I believe we're talking here about traditional Medicare. And um, and I just think it's it's really important for us all to remember that, at least up until recently, Vermont has had a low uptick in Part C. Um, and I think there's been a lot of analysis that uh, um, Part C plans tend to take lower acuity, lower cost people out of the marketplace, out of the, the rest of the traditional group. So states with a lower uptick of Part C um, often uh, will look um, like they cost less. Been some a lot of analysis on that, and I could certainly point you to it. There was there was one it actually done in state as part of the Act ninety nine report recently. Um, um, it, so follow up on Member Merman's question about the medical school. Um, in addition to the the costs that he explored in his questioning, um, I also see. Well, I think it's in addition, if you could clarify. I also see in your audited financials uh, what appears to be a transfer to the medical school annually of you know, in the range of 20 to $30 million. Is that in addition to the dynamics that Member Merman explored? No, the transfers that we um, that are, that are going to UVM are to pay for specific um, costs. So some of that cost is the, the cost of physician salaries that um, a portion of their salary is, is at UVM, but for that time they're actually providing clinical care. Um, so UVM is reimbursed for that, that piece of the salary. Some of that is benefits um, with our physicians. They essentially have a choice where they get their benefits, the ones that are duly um, employed by UVM and the UVM medical group. They can choose to get their benefits through UVM or they can choose to get their benefits through uh, the UVM medical group. Um, so that cost is part of that, uh, that transfer. Plus we do have some space that, uh, that we occupy uh, at UVM. So the transfers are all connected to a, um, uh, an actual operating expense that we should be paying for as a as an academic medical center. Okay, um, I I will leave that topic with the with and, you know. Hey, by the way, no one's questioning the importance of the medical school here. I think the the question really should be what's the right way to fund it. And um, and so I I think that it would be an interesting question to evaluate whether other states have found other ways to fund it other than through ratepayer dollars. Uh, I, that's the place where I find the need to push back as to whether the ratepayers is the right way to fund uh, that part of the medical school. Um, um, I, in follow up to Mr. Vincent's earlier comments about the um, uh, bond rating, uh, about your rating, um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your uh, about the obligated group. Uh, it was curious for me to understand that uh, the entity that is rated here is 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 not the whole UVM Health Network. It is less maybe Porter and Alice Hyde and a couple of other small entities. Can you explain why that is? It's just based on history, um, and actually on October first of this year, uh, those groups will also those two hospitals will also be in the obligated group. Uh, but to be clear, the rating agencies have always looked at us as a health network. Uh, the obligated group to them doesn't doesn't matter um, when they're looking at financial performance. They're looking at our, uh, and they have been looking at our entire health network. Okay, that's interesting to me. I thought I, I was understanding that um, that the that the rating was was only on the entities in the obligated group. You're saying it's everyone. It's everyone. Okay. Yep. Um, so, um, I want to note that so it's similar to my comment about, or my question about the uh, medical school, I want to focus on the cost of the health systems across the lake. Um, 
And, and similar, similarly, I'm not questioning whether those hospitals should be supported. I'm, I'm really meaning to ask, is it Vermont ratepayer dollars that should be supporting them? Um, and, you know, I recognize from their audited financials that um, Alice Hyde um, was down 13 million in 2022. Uh, Champlain Valley Physicians was down 54 million dollars over the last uh, 22 being a, a a particularly bad performance more over there I, 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 what's your view plan of how to manage those costs and um i don't know maybe you could just respond is, is that those people need care just like they're, they're people just like vermonters of course um but is it, should it be Vermont ratepayers that are footing that bill? To be clear, Vermont ratepayers are not footing that bill. So in our budget um, submissions, I think we've clearly laid out that the, the rate increases, both for Medicare and Medicaid and commercial, are driven purely by the cost inflation at Porter, UVM Medical Center, and CVMC. So that is the direct connection to the Vermont um, uh, payers. The same um, avenues that we have here in Vermont are in place in New York. Um, it's not the same regulatory body, but we we deal with the New York payers there for the for the needs of the New York hospitals. Um, we work with the state government there. Obviously, it's it's more difficult in New York than it is in Vermont because it's it's a much larger state and. The, the North Country is a very small portion of the overall state. Um, but to be clear, the Vermont ratepayers do not subsidize New York care. So I may be a little confused, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I thought I had seen transfers uh, transfers over to New York. You're, you're telling me that there's there's no net loss to the network in terms of supporting those hospitals. There's a net loss when you look at the overall performance of the network, um, and we have uh, provided the Green Mountain Care Board um, uh, over the years the net funds flows, both the revenues that come into Vermont, the provider tax revenue that's generated by New York patients to com coming to Vermont, the charges that we charge New York hospitals for their share, their share of shared services. Um, but yes, that that is correct. And and maybe just one more on the same line. Um, and the uh, having those entities in your operating group, obligated group, um, um, well, does that have a negative impact on your bond rating? Certainly. Um, you know the you see the financial uh, results and the struggles there in New York are are quite are quite great. Um, the the, the hospitals, particularly in the, in the North Country of, of New York, are are all struggling. Um, so we're working hard to improve um, performance. Some of the service conversations, obviously, um, you may have followed. We've had to, you know, we've had to have those difficult conversations um, and made those difficult decisions. So we had to close OB services in Malone um, as, a, as a way to consolidate services and try to improve uh, financial performance. Um, and so we're focused on improving that performance, um, but they they do, as you, as you see in our financial results, they do have a negative impact on the overall UVM Health Network uh, finances. I think my last question for uh, today is, um, um, sort of in follow-up to Member Lunge's, maybe it was Member Holmes's question um, about the sale of investments. Um, actually, the combination in, in your audit financials, you you show a or your profit and loss statement. I think you show a, um, uh, what was budgeted as a sixteen or seventeen million dollar sale of investments, and you're projecting a sixty-one um, for twenty-three. Uh, $61 million income. Um, and additionally, um, you also show, um, you, you know, you were budgeted for a 10.7 NPR and you're showing a 
15.5 projected. So two places where, it, uh, at least on that page, it looks like 23 is, turn, is looking good for you. Um, how do you re can you reconcile those numbers for me with, you know, the story you're telling about how tough 23 has been? Yeah, so when you look at those, that revenue piece and looking at our total margin, um, those are all market returns. And as, as we've all seen, the market has done well this year. Um, that is realized income. That doesn't mean that we actually have sold uh, investments. It means that the value of those investments have gone up. Some of them have um, have been sold um, and has generated um, some realized income, but that's that's what you see there. Ninety-five, you know, ninety to ninety-five percent of that income that you uh, that you see in that number is all is all market returns. Is is all unrealized because you haven't sold it. Correct. Is that what you're saying? It's a piece of both. Some of it is realized, and some of it is is unrealized. And it would be a, a strategic decision for UVM as to whether to realize those unrealized. Uh, it's a funny sentence, but you could sell them, right? You could, absolutely. And when you, um, but we don't, uh, we had to last year um, with the, and even some um, uh, a little bit earlier this year, that's where you see for any of the unrestricted, uh, both cash and investments that we have, that's what has contributed to the the day's cash and on hand decline that you've seen. So we've had we did have to sell some investments just to fund routine operations because the 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 routine operations were not generating enough cash to pay the bills. Um, so you don't want to be selling investments. You want to keep them in the market um, so that you can use them at a at a later date for capital projects. For unexpected events, um, so you never, you never want to be in a position of having to sell your event investments because you're essentially, it means you're not generating enough, um, enough revenue in your core operation to to fund all the expenses that you have. So, and the, and the other half of my question, I know I, I asked both about the sale of investments and the NPR numbers. Did, did you have a comment about the projected fifteen point five percent? When you had a budgeted 10, 10.7. So, so you were looking at the total margin? The net patient revenue line. Yeah. Oh, okay. The net patient revenue line, 15% versus a budget of 10 is what yeah. you're. Okay. Yeah, that is, is, as we've shared, I think throughout the, Throughout the day, um, a big piece of that is all our access improvement uh, efforts. Um, so we've worked through a significant amount of backlog in OR cases. Um, we've um, improved our wait times for radiology. Um, we've improved our wait times for clinic appointments. Um, so this is again the the balance. We're trying to meet all the access needs, um, and that certainly has generated uh, more NPR than what. Uh, than what we budgeted. Okay, thank you. Sam, why don't you go ahead? Thank you. Can folks hear me okay? Great. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. And if any of the, as Mike said, if any of these questions uh, move into territory that'd be better addressed in the executive session, please let me know. Um, just looking through the last four or five years of your audited financials, I'm wondering if you could describe a little bit in more detail some of the purposes of the subsidiaries that exist underneath the parent, uh, particularly UVM Health Ventures and the Medical Center Foundation. I'm just wondering if you could describe what the purpose of those entities are. Uh, so the UVM Health Ventures Corporation um, is, uh, there are times when we make investments in private equity um, Companies, so part of our uh, investment strategy to be well diversified is we invest in um, publicly traded um, investments, bonds, and privately held uh, companies. And for some of those investments, uh, due to tax um, uh, tax reasons, uh, we do run some of those investments through the Vermont Health uh, Ventures. Um, very, very small amount of investments that we ultimately have to have to run through there. 
And in terms of the uh, foundation, sorry, that, that kind of predates me, so I might need to call on on one of my colleagues here to explain what uh, the purpose of that. Steve, do you so the, the foundation is basically our arm for philanthropy. So we have the UVM Medical Center Foundation that's philanthropy. It's a separate board that raises money for the medical center. Thank you. It does, you, it does, oh, it does not, just to be clear, it does not have a balance sheet of its own. There are no assets that sit there. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, are you able to quantify the amount? You said it was small, Mr. Vincent, um, the amount held in, because I believe the network is an equity holder in the health ventures. Are you able to quantify that amount? I am. We'll follow up uh, with you on the exact amount. Okay. Um, shifting over a little bit, following up on some of the board questions on the Population Health Services Organization, I'm wondering, and it's possible you mentioned this and I missed it, how you plan to evaluate progress towards the, you know, the outcomes and cost reductions that it seems to be the, is the primary purpose of the organization. How will you evaluate that over time? The approach to, do you want me to go ahead, Rick? Yeah, please do. Yeah, so approach to evaluation for the PHSO is really in terms of initially implementation metrics, so things like uh, hiring care managers, assessments, care care plans, then moving into process-based metrics, so looking at utilization uh, year over year for population. So yeah, ED utilization, for example, or inpatient utilization, admits per thousand, sort of those types of, and then moving into outcomes over time. And so those outcomes will be cost-driven metrics and they'll be benchmarked, of course, and we'll use literature to drive some of that, and also our partnership with health services researchers, which is one of the things that we're looking to build in the PHSO to have robust evaluations for all of the programs that we build across the PHSO. Thanks, I appreciate that. Do you have a like a time horizon, short-term, long-term goals for when some of these metrics, you know, we can expect to see or hope to see improvement? Um, uh, so typically, if you if you want to talk about a particular program, we want, want to talk about the care manager program, which is, I would say, the one that is um, really most mature at this point, although still really growing. Um, typically, what literature tells us that you need 18 to 24 months of longitudinal care management before you, you see change and, and true outcomes. However, you can see short-term gains pretty quickly. Um, and so some of that we are realizing and seeing now, a lot of the reporting we're actually starting to think through. So I would say that it's reasonable to think that within the next year, we will have initial reporting to be able to provide from the PHSO, and then that will obviously grow over time. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, shifting gears a little bit, um, a couple of years ago, the CEO of the Mayo Clinic uh, made a controversial comment that they, at the Mayo Clinic plan to prioritize commercial patients over patients that have public insurance and then walked it back. And we've heard a lot of discussion today about the cost shift and the impact on commercial rate payers and the importance of commercial revenue. I'm wondering if UVM Health Network or any of the entities within it, is there any prioritization for non-emergency inpatient or outpatient services for appointments for patients? Do you prioritize commercial patients in any way? Absolutely not, um, and I, I think we've got we have some physicians here on the on the on the screen that can can also add in from a provider perspective, from a clinician's perspective. Um, we're we're insurance blind. Uh, we we take care of everybody that comes to our door, um, and we essentially obviously there are front end things that we have to do in terms of prior authorizations and other things um, to to get um, patients financially cleared, um, but we don't um, uh, we don't restrict access to care um, based on insurance in any in any way. Uh, Steve, you know if you want to add anything. Couldn't have said it better, Rick. We absolutely are payer blind to all the care we deliver. Okay. Thank you. Um, last question, um, focus on race equity, particularly as I know that's been an area of investment in um, particularly in your DEI department. I'm wondering what metrics you've specifically identified to hopefully make progress on in the, in the coming years and how you plan to evaluate progress in that. So for, so for that, I'll turn to a, to a, 
you're probably wondering which one I'm going to turn to. So I'll start with uh, with Sunny first. Sure. So it's a great question. Um, we have a number of metrics that we're looking at, um, but I'll just start with the really basics around education. Um, so we have uh, this year come up with a unified education plan for our entire organization. So all 15,000 plus employees plus our board members with a goal of getting 80% of our staff educated on just simply the basics of what it means to be diverse, um, how to have those conversations with each other so that people feel safe and can bring um, the sense of belonging to the organization. Uh, and then for all 100% of all new employees going through that training. The second is how do we actually increase diversity in, in every way that we look at it across our organization? So whether that's race or ethnicity and non-English speakers or so sexual orientation, gender identity, ability, um, poverty, how do we bring a more diverse group of people into our organization? What we realized is that our metrics today are not great in the way that we've captured them. Um, by that, I mean probably somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of our all of our staff, if we look across all of our institutions, um, have left that question blank around race and ethnicity as a simple one. But it's even it's even low, uh, higher. That is that they left it blank if we ask about sexual orientation, gender identity. And so before we can identify um, growth in those areas, we need to start by making sure that we have an adequate capture of the data. So starting in September, we've, we're starting a new campaign um, across all of our entities just to simply create safety so that people can adequately and, um, and safely feel like they can report uh, on their own identities. And so that's the two big pieces across the network. And then when we look about health care equity, that is, is the quality of care that we deliver across our network um equitable we know it's not today meaning in the metrics that we're looking at so we're looking at a number of them and david probably has a much bigger idea of this but i'll give you the ones that that I've, i'm focusing on um breast cancer screening colon cancer screening diabetes um treatment so hemoglobin a1c as a measure of diabetes and hypertensive treatment we know that if you're black um if you live in a poor area, um, your every one of those measures is lower than if you're white or live in a, a zip code that has a higher level of, of uh, uh, wealth. And so we started in this year, FY23, to go forward on trying to identify what do we need to do to improve those and focusing on those particular metrics to try to move forward. So it just gives you an idea. There's There's a lot of work going on and a lot of work on um across our organization just just to bring those to light and to show the particular areas so if you're practicing in a particular zip code we want you to know what your numbers are and what you need to do so that's the work that's going on this year um it ties into the work that jessica was mentioning around our population health services work that we need to go out and really drive this out not just keep it inside but first starts with just being able to make sure that we have adequate data on that so thanks for asking Thank you. Appreciate it. Back to you, Chair Foster. Thanks. Um, one quick follow up on the health ventures. Um, is that is there any University of Vermont Medical Center or health network money that goes in to fund the investments that makes? Yes. OK, and are there policies prohibiting health ventures from investing in companies that UVM Health Network executives have a stake in? Um, I'll look to Eric. I don't know if you, uh, you're able to answer that. There are no investments by UVM Health Venture, Health Network Ventures that are in companies that, to my knowledge, Chair Foster, are owned by UVM Health Network executives. Part of the reason of having health ventures is to support research that may be commercializable by our physicians who are also employed by the university. And so in that sense, there may be uh, investments in, for instance, a new invention that's being worked on and partially owned by a professor physician. 
but not on behalf of leaders at the UVM Health Network. Yeah, what I'm getting at is just making sure there's policies where the money that's being funded into Health Network, sorry, from Health Network isn't being used to invest in products that you know, executives have obviously. No, I mean you the, get the, that, the, Mr. Miller. Yeah, the, sure. the, no, no, it's not the case. And as you know, as a as a 501c3 organization, we also have very, very strict conflict of interest policies and controls in place that prohibit us from engaging in um, interested party transactions. And of course, we abide by those scrupulously. Of course, right. Um, I, I'm going to just draw your attention to a um, a video interview with Z Dog MD and Marty, I forget his last name, but it interviewed um, Chris Jones from Health Ventures. Uh, it's from January 15th, 2020. And there was some discussion of the JP Morgan conference and what hotel rooms cost and um, uh, how much it costs to get a cup of coffee and things like that. that. That segment's in the first early five minutes or so. And I just wanted to flag it. I don't know what they were really saying, but it sounded expensive. And I just want to make sure that that kind of expense, I, they didn't say they were spending that money, but it's, it's worth looking at. Please like, take a look at it. And, um, uh, you know, we don't want to have that kind of expensive hotel rooms and the like. Um, and I don't know if that was actually going on in that video or not. It wasn't really clear. Um, I will turn it back to you folks for um, any closing statement, if you if you have any, and then there's some hands raised and we'll, we'll turn to that after. And thank you. Uh, Chair, I, I, I think uh, we've been doing the public comment before the closing statements. Oh. Uh, so I think that would be the appropriate oh, order. Great. Yeah, great, yeah. thank you. Yeah, even better. Um, and uh, uh, Ms. Brown, thank you for waiting. Your hand was up first. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. My name is Betsy Brown. I am a lead at the UVMMC Provider Access Services Call Center. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. And before I start my comment, I'd like to say that I've been on this Zoom since eight o'clock this morning. I have been patiently waiting for hours, listening to all of you. And I presume that all of those other people from the public who are here to speak today will get the opportunity to say what they have to say. I have worked at the past call center for more than 14 years. I am a member of the UVMMC Support Staff United, the newest and biggest union at UVMMC. There are over 2,300 of us in over 140 different titles. It is a diverse group at the bottom of the pay scale at UVMMC. We are the backbone of the hospital. We clean the rooms, cook and serve the food, draw patients' blood, help take images, help dispense medications, register patients, transport patients, bill patients, distribute supplies and equipment, schedule appointments, answer phones, page providers and staff, call the codes, care for patients, many of whom are challenging and sometimes violent. I could go on and on. Without us, the hospital simply cannot operate. Providers, managers, directors, vice presidents, and those at the very top are paid anywhere from three to 32 times more than the vast majority of our union members comparing $31,000 for a full-time union member versus over a million dollars for someone at the top of the hospital. We all pay the same premium for health insurance, regardless of our pay scale. The members of UVMMC Support Staff United should be paid a livable wage and health insurance premiums should be on a sliding scale based on a pay scale. If UVMMC is allowed to increase their fees, they should be directed to first use their money to support their most important resource, the staff who work for and with them. Why build new facilities when they are unable to hire and retain staff to operate the facilities they already have? If the staff is respected, paid a livable wage, and have fair access to health care themselves, the hospital will be able to retain staff and serve the community safely. 
Thank you. Thank you for your comment and your patience, Ms. Brown, and we will take every public comment for as long as we need to. Um, I appreciate everyone waiting. Um, let me see who's next. Um, Ms. Gutwin, please go ahead. So I just oh. muted and turn yours up. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Sharon Gutwin. I'm the owner of a physical therapy practice called the Rehab Gym. Um, I'm, I'm also um, a member of the Green Mountain Care Board Advisory Committee. Um, I appreciate UVM Health Network. I have gone there for care and will always be grateful. Um, I am, my comments are not as much for the direct hospital care, but more of care that can be delivered in other non-hospital based uh, locations, more in communities. Um, I think UVM Health Network provided a formidable presentation, but what I felt is lacking is any awareness or appreciation that they're not the only business in the Vermont healthcare system. They're a large part, the largest part, but the best system requires collaboration, not autocracy. And I feel that the sense of autocracy or being in a bubble, and I understand, I mean, everybody, representing UVM Health Network is here to only advocate for UVM Health Network. I understand that, but it shouldn't operate in the bubble. And if it operates in the bubble, that's the core of what I think is negative that stimulates the growth that is becoming more of a monopoly instead of a collaboration with the health, other healthcare providers within this Vermont healthcare system. And it's a small state. We all know each other. We should be able to work in collaboration and cooperation and not be adversaries. Um, the reduction actually in healthcare expense is less about being more efficient or reducing the delivery of care, but reduction of health care in general. We need less hospital care because that is the most expensive care. Of course, it's most expensive for all the reasons laid out. But we can avoid having as many Vermonters going into this expensive care that is driving up the insurance premiums. So as long as focus is on financing a hospital centric healthcare model, healthcare expenses can only be expected to rise and at a higher rate than the community centric care model. And I, I trust that everyone that is in this discussion, over a hundred are listening to this that we really, 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 really all want to be healthy Vermonters having a happy life. That's fundamentally why we're all here. I want that. I believe people in the hospital want that. Um, I don't compare my business, the rehab gym, to a hospital because it's not apples to apples but I can compare my business to the outpatient PT model that is owned by the hospital. And I can speak about that and I want it to be on public record. We face the identical inflation rates, hiring challenges, the need to upgrade, the repair, the pay of bills. I even have an elevator in one of my locations. I, I just spent $9,000 to repair that and listened to a whole lot of complaints while it was under, under repairs. Our payer mix is identical. We are also payer blind and we have uncomped care. Our um, budget shows actually a higher revenue percentage uh, going to employee comp um, than 
Um, the major difference is, as Owen alluded to, are that the reimbursements are up to four times higher for same services in a hospital-based outpatient clinic. And we know this because of the CMS transparency ruling that, that uh, both hospitals and commercial payers are not obligated to contribute to. So um, it's not yet user-friendly, but my daughter who is not needing computers to be user-friendly has dived in. So all of this, um, all of the CPT codes that we are under can be compared apples to apples. So when I say it's four times higher, there's evidence of that, and I, I provided it to the Greenmount Care Board. Um, the, the rules are known. Like what, what did confuse me was it, it sounded like people that were representing the hospital didn't really know what the rest of the healthcare system was facing. So that's kind of why I'm speaking. I'd rather not. I'd rather be outside enjoying my day. But I, I think that that also speaks to the point that that has already been mentioned, that it's not it's not it's not positive. It doesn't shine a positive light on the hospital. So we'll pretend it's not there and and and, and maybe it'll blow over. Well, my business has reached the critical point where the lead balloon has gotten heavier and it's falling. So um, after being at near flat rates for uh, since 2015, um, we're at the breaking point. And what reality presents us is um, after redu <laughs> reducing our CEO, CFO, and owner in, in is as low as we can go, I'm on 24,000 a year. <laughs> um, I can't find any more money to squeeze. Um, so this is where we're at. If we cannot get rates from the commercial payers, which have already testified. Tom Weigel from Blue Cross and Blue Shield said that he, he that because the hospital demands what the Green Mountain Care Board provides, they have had no choice but to have that come from everyone else. And I'm speaking for every, probably every other non-hospital based business and possibly even hospitals in Vermont that compete with you. I don't know, but I do know this, I'm not alone. And I am having to make a very painful decision after 20 years in business and in the major provider of physical therapy in the state of Vermont who is at the forefront of reform in preventative care, trying to keep a people out of physical therapy, out of hospitals, out of doctor's offices, and can provide plenty of evidence that that's effective in this medically oriented gym, I have no choice but to go out of network and get the higher out of network rates. This goes against my very reason for going into business. And if I go out of network, there is a potential for the cost shifting to be even more extreme. Speaking of cost shifting, I've heard nobody speak of the actual cost shifting of the private community-based business towards the hospital to meet demands. The money has to come from somewhere, it's not the trees. And so if there's a limited amount of, of commercial, money we are uh we are not getting it if the hospital gets it um a couple more things the um the margin and, and volume it, they do matter costco shows how low margins and high volume do cover the bills 
And the rehab gym has had the pleasure being the size it is to be actually strong because we have high volume. So the pennies we make on the dollar can go farther. And then uh, last thing is hospitals and other healthcare systems. Oh, I'm, I'm keeping the finger in my role as an advisor to the, uh, not an advisory committee to the Green Mountain Care Board. I'm keeping my finger on the pulse of what is going on in the nation. Certainly what Vermont is facing is, is really not unique. It's, it's nationwide. And uh, <clears throat> the, um, there are systems and hospitals that are reducing the administrative roles along with salaries um, out of some out of the fact that they're forced to because they don't get all the money they want but others strictly because they're being proactive. They see it's not sustainable. When I heard the term, what was it? Uh, dart board number, 24%. I was in my living room that came on the news and my jaw dropped. I mean, everyone in this call and on the Zoom should like stop and think 24%? What? <laughs> um, so, I, I want us to stop thinking of individual bubbles and, and I'm 66. I, I'm not gonna be in this profession that much longer. I would love to see before I leave this profession an actual paradigm shift where we're starting to focus on where we can actually reform healthcare. It's not from a hospital. You can't put the fox in charge of the hen house. It's like Kentucky Fried Chicken working on people to stop eating chicken. Prevention, health, wellness, fitness, mental, physical, is best applied in communities in a variety of settings as universal as individual mankind presents. So I am hoping, although it's a big ask, that the hospital can actually start focusing on what it does best. Where everybody agrees, the hospital needs to take care of the sick and injured and do a fabulous job. And you should get paid for what you're doing to save people's lives and create health when people are sick. Let me, let other providers that have absolutely nothing to gain from a sick person and only everything to Kane from a healthy person that's basically plugged back into an active life. That's physical therapy, that's social work, that's primary care, that's occupational therapy, pediatrics, that, that, that speech therapy. There, there, there's, there's, there's those professionals along with the fitness industry, health coaching, if we pay anywhere close to 24%, even over the 8.6 that the board has originally tried to stick with, that is money not being spent on the health care, true health care, health care of, Vermont, of Vermonters. And it's investing in a sick care system that can go so long before it implodes. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Goodwin. Um, Mr. Hoffman. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, we can, yes. Um, Chair Foster, I have, if it's okay with you, I have a technologically challenged uh, guest who I'm helping. Uh, would you allow him to go and then I'll follow him here on Teams? Um, if you unmute line 917 696 7902, I have David Taft from Milton to share, uh, and then I'll follow his call on Teams. Um, absolutely, that's no problem. Um, Ms. Lajanis, do you know how to unmute Mr. Taft on that number? Not sure I do. Microsoft Teams does not allow us to unmute individuals. I'm sorry. Okay, so you need me to unmute my our phones? 
star six nine, I believe. Oh, well. Hey, Mr. Taft, it's Owen Foster from the Care Board. Um, okay. Can hear you. I can hear you fine. How you doing? Okay, I'm doing fine. Okay. The the floor is yours if you'd like to make a public comment for us. Oh, okay. Um, unfortunately, um, my aspect that I'm concerned about um, is. This all started for me back in 2019. Um, I ended up with a medical situation where I was brought to the emergency room um, and they did some blood work on me. Um, and unfortunately, my PSA level for prostate cancer was elevated in the emergency room. Um, my doctor who, I'm sorry, but I can't remember his name at the time, was, uh, I don't know if he was notified of it at the time when I got it done. But um, unfortunately, that, like I said, it was in 2019. Um, I ended up with a new doctor in 2022 who did some blood work on me and she diagnosed me with prostate cancer and I was given over to a cancer doctor, um, Lester Cole, who determined that I did have the prostate cancer. Um, and when I asked him how long I've had it, he said that apparently from what he could see in my paperwork, um, my, I was showing numbers back in 2019. Um, unfortunately, I didn't show any signs illness-wise to tell me something was wrong, but it just unfortunately, from 2019 to 2022, um, I went all that time without knowing because no one um, took the initiation from the emergency room area to either notify my doctor or my doctor didn't notify me. So I went two years with the cancer, which could have probably been taken care of by surgery if it was caught in time. And unfortunately, by the time they noticed it, it already spread. So the surgery was not an option for me. So I ended up having to go through numerous um, radiation treatments. And uh, it just, my biggest concern is um, what I went through, what I could have, uh, I mean, right now I'm doing fine, but the aspect of the whole thing is um, why wasn't my situation with cancer, which is more of a priority of anything, brought up to the point where someone should have notified me right off the bat. Um, I know back then they had the ordeal with <clears throat> the COVID and I feel like even though, you know, they were trying to do their best, um, my cancer situation got put on the back shelf. And by the time I was realized what's going on, it was too far. And my procedures were more extreme than they should have been. Um, 
me and my wife had been through a very emotional time because of it. Um, and I've been having problems with health insurance to the point where one time I got it, one time I don't, because uh, I didn't have Medicare at the time. And I had Medicaid, but they've been bouncing me back and forth on I have it, I don't have it. But the issue of it all is how much money was spent out of my pocket and the hospitals on a procedure that could have been taken care of a lot sooner. Um, and like I said, um, me and my wife went through this um, financially and emotionally were, unfortunately, I hate to say it this way, but I feel myself that on my behalf, the hospital dropped the ball and notifying me to let me know. And now I got to fall down on the front of it and make the best of what I got. Um, Mr. Taft, um, yeah, wasn't sure if you were finished and I didn't want to interrupt if you have more that you'd like to share about your experience. Yeah. Um, it just, uh, it was very frustrating and, uh, I just feel like I think the hospital could have been able to step up a little bit more on their prior tourization whether it's the emergency room or whatever, with their communications with each doctor and each patient for the uh, the seriousness of their illness. Um, if I only had a, you know, uh, an infection in my throat, okay, yeah, no problem. You know, that can sit back a little bit if need be. But I think any time somebody comes down with any form of cancer, whether it's a minimal type of cancer or a major, I think that should be a priority one into someone's health to get taken care of more immediately and not going on to the back shelf like mine did until a new doctor decided to do blood work, and that's how they found it. So I went two years on the back shelf with cancer, not even knowing I had it, were prioritized. They should have known about it right off the bat. And I just feel myself that somewhere in the hospital, someone dropped the ball. Has, has anyone reached out to you about financial assistance issues in the last few weeks? Um, they did. But um, they were telling me that uh, because of supposedly financial situations, um, the Medicaid that I did have, they took from me, um, they said I didn't qualify for it. And yeah, so I'm on Medicare right now. But um, even though it only covers so much, um, with me being on disability now because of my COPD that happened in 2019, I'm on a fixed budget. Um, my wife has insurance, but she can only afford insurance for herself and not for the two of us because it's too expensive. And even with the insurance that I have, I'm taking more money out of my pocket to take care of the medications I need. Um, and even though I got my insurance, it's still not enough to balance out for me financially. I'm still struggling trying to get my medications because my insurance won't kick in until I meet this requirement every month. And by the time I do, it starts all over again because it goes monthly. 
So in all long run, all my medication's coming out of my pocket. So it's like I'm paying all this money for health insurance. I'm paying out money for my medications. And it's like, where, why am I spending all this money for on insurance and things if my insurance ain't going to cover anything? And it's gotten to the point where I'm almost to the point of, okay, if I get sick, can I go to the hospital? I really don't know because that's money that I can't really afford to pay. Um, my medication, can I afford that? Well, um, if I'm in good needs with a good ward upstairs, okay, I might be able to get by without taking it, but do I have that choice? Um, it's pretty sad when you have to take and balance your health over a money situation. And it's just, that's the part I'm getting at where, like the other woman was saying, you guys want to raise your system by 24%. I'm on a fixed budget. I cannot afford to have my insurance my medication and everything go up just to help satisfy you guys. Um, and I think I speak on behalf of a lot of this stuff who are on fixed incomes. Um, it's going to get to the point where, unfortunately, we're going to have to start making a decision on um, our medication and also being able to go in and get ourselves taken care of through our doctors because it's getting to that point where we can't afford to do it no more. And where do we draw the line? Enough is enough. Chair, Chair Foster, this is um, Dr. Leffler. If I can get Mr. Taft's name and phone number, I can have patient advocacy call him first thing tomorrow to see if we can help. Um, okay. Um, I have talked to um, the hospital. They put me on a payment plan. I was like, okay. Um, I received two bills from a collection agency because the hospital sent two of my bills to the collection agency because supposedly I was taking too long to pay on my medical bill. I can only give you guys so much money. And if it's taken so long that you guys have to put me in a collection agency and ruin my credibility, I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I called you guys, we made plans to do a payment plan, and then you pull this on me. It's like, I might as well talk to a wall. You guys are going to do what you want, and you don't care about us. You just want your money, and that's how I feel. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Mr. Taft, I'll get Dr. Leffler's number to provide you or somebody that he can, in case you want to reach out again. Um, maybe it'll help, and I acknowledge what you've been through is excruciating. Um, you can you keep speaking. There? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. David, did you have anything more to share? Um, I'm pretty much set on what I need to say. Um, I think I got my point across that, you know, I can only do so much and I can't do any more. And there's people out there like me who are in that same boat. And all we're doing is asking for a little bit of consideration and a little bit of help from the hospital to make things easier on us. That's all we are asking. And uh, you know, I just have to sit back now after saying what I had to say and uh, see what happens. And 
to do the best I can. And hopefully I don't uh, have to file a bankruptcy situation because of paying all my medical bills. And also uh, taking the chance and having to jeopardize my health because of my medication and uh, getting the help that I need. So that's where I'm at right now. Mr. Taft, thanks for taking the time to participate and, and share your experience because I think it's really important for all of us to, it's sobering and it's important. So thank you for, for speaking up and participating and um, being here. Um, Mr. Hoffman, did you have a comment as well or? Yeah, I have a com some comments I'd like to make if that's okay. Of course. Thank you. Um, I want to point out that uh, Mr. Taft's trying to diligently pay down this debt that really isn't his to owe as a result of uh, a misdiagnosis. And with all the investments in health information technology and care management and population health and on and on, this should have been caught. And so my hope is that uh, instead of destroying his credit and possibly causing him to go bankrupt, this hospital can help him uh, not only retire the arrears, but provide him the care he needs free of cost going forward. Um, but I, I want to make some other comments. Um, the type of diagnosis and treatment David needed in 2019 is it's the fundamentals of medicine, and that requires sufficient staffing. Since 2018, the network has coordinated the redirection of hundreds of millions of dollars that would have otherwise been available to direct patient care to the sexier work of population health, IT execs paid at 15 times the medium income of Vermont Vermonters who fund their salaries, IT projects at three times the national average cost, some of the most costly per square foot vanity building projects in the country, and concurrent to expanding its revenue and balance sheet, uh, Mr. or Dr. Epen's predecessor went on a more than decade long spending spree and acquisition endeavor. State of hospitals presently reminds me of the state of retail before I left it for healthcare. Massive con consolidation transpired from the late 90s through the Great Financial Recession. Enormous sums were spent on expensive but low margin acquisitions and handsome executive salaries to manage them. And then the business model broke after the Great Financial Recession when tremendous deflationary pressures, uh, particularly with the entrance of online retailing. Shareholders raced to justify every line item of expense, returning conglomerates to the fundamentals. And eventually, those conglomerates either went bankrupt or were chopped up into what was valuable. Similarly, hospitals post-COVID faced tremendous inflationary pressures, which have broken their business model. Their model is now broken, and they have to respond. Vermonters are the health network's shareholders, and the Green Mountain Care Board is those Vermonters' board of directors. As with retail after, the, after GFR, the Green Mountain Care Board in the state of Vermont must examine every line of cost, examining its return on investment. Chair Foster's repeatedly asked academics and hospital executives how to balance controlling costs and not reducing access to care, which is routinely held out as a threat if the budgets aren't granted. There are four main areas where nonprofit, and I say that in quotes, hospitals plow profits. Executive compensation, vanity building projects, excessive IT spending, and unproven population level endeavors with poor outcomes. The four top executives seated before you today shared an aggregate of 4 million in C-suite compensation, averaging to 1 million per executive, or 33 times Vermonters' median income paying their salaries. Many more were on this call today. Dr. Epen's predecessor went on unbridled spending spree on executive recruitment, snatching up a former regulator at a cost of 800,000 annually, another former regulator from Vermont AHS, presumably at 15 times median Vermont wages, a former US attorney who's on this call today at 610,000 or 20 times Vermont median wages, 
a former Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont executive on this call today. Again, presumably at 15 times median wages, and the list goes on and on. There are members of this Green Mountain Care Board regulating these very executives equally qualified to perform some of their roles, and yet you work for many, many multiples less, as does the governor of the state of Vermont. The health network, even accounting for their proposed change in math, which would have reduced their admin to clinical comp ratio from 2.1, still remains at the high whisker mark or more than 71% above the national median, demonstrating, as Member Walsh said, economies of scale have not been realized. And I will, renew, I will enumerate further momentarily how this is a top heavy organization. Reducing the network from 24% to the median of 14% in this category would yield some of the savings necessary for the hundreds of frontline staff who have written into all of you this week, crying out for help. It's the type of move shareholders would demand after leadership abandoned management fundamentals for a decade. The Health Network proposes an outpatient surgical center that on a cost per square foot basis is the most expensive proposed build in the nation at three to five times the cost of similar builds. No less than th two hospitals and a nurses union have petitioned for interested party status to protest the ill-conceived nature of this proposed $150 million investment to be made by Vermont tax and premium payers. Such profligate spending results in facility fees and outside consumption of scarce health care dollars in this system. This is exactly what Ms. Gutman was talking about, which every year risks to put folks like her who offer higher value, lower cost community care out of business forever, exacerbating the current well-documented access to care crisis Vermont faces. And while the network may claim it's necessary to do these things to recruit top talent. Go down to Rutland and ask our state, the state of Vermont's highest paid physician, Mel Boyton, if he stayed at Rutland Region, Regional Medical Center all these years because of its lavish atrium. The Health Network has spent hundreds of millions on IT infrastructure since 2019, but has never told Vermonters what ROI they've received for it. In 2024 alone, the network proposes to spend 150 million on IT. That's three times the national average of 3% of, of operating expense for similar hospitals. On this line alone, 100 million in 2024 exceeds the national average spend for the same. Top heavy management for this division includes an SB, SVP of network IT at 655,000 annually or 20 times Vermont median income, a network SVP Network VP of Health Informatics at 450,000 or 15 times Vermont median income. A Chief Medical Informatics, again, 450,000 50, and 15 times median income. A VP of Enterprise Info Management and Analytics, presumably at similar comp. The network has led the state's health reform efforts. Since 2018, hundreds of millions of scarce health care dollars have been poured into their ACO. And now the network proposes to spend another 23 million this year alone on a duplicative population health services organization and only provides very high level aspirational language around its aims and accomplishments over the past 24, 21 months. This is eerily reminiscent of the same language its ACO used for years before former AHS commissioner Mike Smith said, it needed to move on from being aspirational to being operationalized. Top heavy management in this sector includes 2 million spent on ACO executives, 590,000 on an SVP of high value care, 510,000 on SVP and chief, po chief population health and quality, an assistant general counsel of population health, whatever that is. I, I, I've not seen that at other hospitals, but apparently it's necessary for Vermonters to pay for, as well as a VP of managed care contracting who was on the call today. I cautioned their ACO in 2018. It could not achieve its aims with the analytics it possessed. They were not actionable or reliable, despite continuing to represent otherwise to this board, DIVA, the legislature, and the public otherwise. <clears throat> 
For that, I was terminated by my supervisor. That supervisor is now the VP over analytics I just mentioned a, minute, a moment ago for the health network. Four years later, Blue Cross Blue Shield Vermont would cite lack of actionable data and consequent interventions as part of its reason for withdrawing. And even the NORC report assesses that providers find the analytics similarly insufficient or irrelevant. Since 2018, the network's leadership of healthcare reform has seen its three most important clinical quality measures, hypertension, depression screening, and substance use disorder screening underperform as hypertension scores bounce between the 60th and 70th percentiles and depression and substance use disorder weren't even benchmarked and rates of uptake and screening showed little improvement in them. From 2018 to 2021, what CDC data tragically shows us is that hypertension, suicide, and substance use disorder related deaths grew far in excess of national average for age-adjusted mortality and likely resulted in over 500 additional age-adjusted deaths beyond national averages over the same period. This isn't the high baseline that Vermont already has over the national average for those same measures. This is just the growth of growth from 2018 to 2022, 2021. 4,000 Vermonters died in excess of the national average at baseline but just the growth of growth yielded 500 additional age-adjusted deaths. On these important quality measures that hundreds of millions were poured into, time to get back to the fundamentals of medicine. Every line item matters. The time for pie and sky is over. The public would make the following requests accordingly. First and foremost, we clear the credit history of David Taff after it was destroyed. Reimburse him for all he's paid to treat stage four cancer that metastasized because of a missed prostate cancer diagnosis in 2019. Immediately pay for him to receive a second opinion on his current treatment course and reassure him that the prostate that wasn't surgically intervened in addition to the cancer found in his ribs will remain in remission with the Health Network's chosen course of treatment. Provide him free care for all remaining course of treatment. Deny the current certificate of need for the Surgical Outpatient Center until and if its projected costs are brought in line with national cost per square foot averages. It can be shown that the UVM Health Network will provide the better quality and cost of care than current care in the region or by those who, like the Green Mountain Surgical Center, have had their requests denied to expand specialties in the region while offering higher value, lower, lower cost care. Reduce the 2024 budget by an amount equal to the excess of 3% of operating expense for their IT investments, currently $100 million, and demand an ROI accounting for all EPIC investments made to date. Finally, We'd ask Dr. Eapen to perform a thorough accounting and evaluation of the executive leadership that has been rolled up into the stable over the last decade, including their total compensation as compared to national median averages for the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't normally comment on public comment because um, they're all really valuable, and so I don't get a chance to do that. Um, and I don't think it's appropriate, but I will just thank you for pointing out the uh, care board staff that is really talented and works really hard. And I think, um, you know, they take state salaries and they do great work. So thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate that. And they've had a really hard couple of weeks doing this work. Um, so thanks. Um, Ms. Snell, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I did want to, uh, first, I wasn't going to speak up at this meeting. I was just here to observe. Um, and then there was a few comments made that I just felt like I needed to respond to. In particular, Mr. Miller's um, comments about executive compensation, because I found that very disturbing that that kind of numbers and that kind of information is being withheld. 
Um, I do hope that in executive session, that when it is brought up, that the possibility that the Green Mountain Care Board could sign an NDA to get that information. We have had to do that in union negotiations in the past to get that information. I do hope that whatever hospitals the UVMC and network administration is using to benchmark themselves against is the same hospitals that they are using to benchmark and market their own employees. When we bargained back in 2018, um, they kind of had the audacity to compare us to a 100 bed rural hospital in Maine when they were looking at our salary. So that has always stuck with me that that's how they look at their employees, unfortunately. Um, and I do want to thank Dr. Leffler for somewhat standing up for union negotiations and being an important part of our work at the Academic Medical Center, that we do bring value and we do bring employees there because they know that they have certain rights and roles that they may not have had at other hospitals. My other comment, and I think that um, Mr. Hoffman before me spoke much more eloquently than I would ever be able to, is on the network, the shared administrative services. Um, I agree with him that the expenses, the $407 million, the shared total expenses is kind of outrageous. And especially in my mind, when I was looking at it and granted, I'm looking at it in very broad terms, but when you look at the managers, there is one manager for every six employees average <laughs> at that level. And that is a little mind boggling to me that those employees would need that kind of oversight. And if they truly do, then something needs to change at that level. Um, I, will, I will stop there. Um, and I, I thank the Green Mountain Care Board for all of their work. And I thank the UVM Medical Center for being in the hot seat for these, what, seven, eight hours now. And I do appreciate everyone's time and attention on this very important matter. Thank you, Ms. Snell. Um, and I believe the care board scheduled a hearing with, with you and the nurses soon. So thanks for Correct. doing that. Um, yes, we, didn't, we didn't ask a lot of questions around the nursing shortage because I, I know mm -hmm. we have that scheduled. Um, yeah. um, so uh, Ms. Interact. Yeah, I yeah, was I was gonna call on you, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you got, you got, your hand went down. So Ms. Cyril Schrader, go go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for the time for me to speak today. Um, my name is Becky Cyril Schrader and I've worked for UVMMC for over 11 years. I first worked at what was originally when I started um, per, um, PPS and then it became the Regional Transfer Center. I left there in July of 2020 when I was laid off along with two of my coworkers because the massive epic project made our jobs absolutely obsolete. In January of 2021, I started at Provider Access, the call center. Um, I actually overnight worked a 12 hour shift from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and have been on this team's meeting off and on since 8 a.m. this morning. I've heard a lot of numbers. But what I want to talk about today, right now, is people, is human beings. Not only have I worked for the hospital for 11 years, over 11 years, I've been a patient of this hospital for much longer than that. I am here today to implore the board to hold UVMMC accountable for the care given to its most valuable asset and resource, the human beings that make this hospital run. We are the invisible workers that until we formed our union were easy to ignore. We answer their phones, we clean their rooms, we draw labs for their patients and process them. We page out their codes, we cook their patients meals, we fill their prescriptions and so much more. No employee working at not only Vermont's largest employer, but also its largest healthcare provider should have to worry about homelessness, food insecurity, or the inability to afford, afford health insurance, healthcare, or medication 
due to being paid poverty wages. Right now, the taxpayers of Vermont are funding UVMMC, refusing to pay a livable wage in the form of food stamps, housing subsidies, and Medicaid and doctor taking the taxpayers money and robbing their hardworking employees of their dignity. My office recently started a food pantry in our break room because so many of our colleagues and coworkers are so food insecure, they were coming to work, working full shifts without eating because they were deciding between rent and healthcare and food. I, I would also like to point out that there are multiple executives in this hospital who make more in one week than I make in one year. Another way that UVMMC has chosen to save money is by not having 24 hour security in multiple sites that have 24 hour staff. At least two of these sites have been breached by people not associated with the hospital. When I asked about adding security, they locked the elevators instead and said, well, they can't move from floor to floor if we do that. I asked for a keypad. They said, we'll see what we can do. I demanded a keypad. Rather than buying a keypad, they went and found an empty office and stole it off of that door. We also received an email giving us tips on how to keep ourselves safe. It's my job to be safety and security for myself. I was there one of the nights that people broke into the building I was working in. I don't like feeling unsafe at work. That's not a way to save money. As a patient, the care that I have received from UVMMC over the years has been a mixed bag. I have received wonderful care. I have also received care that has been affected by worker retention rates that are terrible. Major medication errors caused by new staff. Major scheduling errors with surgeries and testing that nearly cost me going to my grandmother's funeral because nobody was communicating with each other and people didn't know what they were doing because they aren't being retained. If you don't pay people a livable wage, they won't stay. And you constantly have a lack of knowledgeable, skilled workers. Um, I just, I know that UVMMC can do better than what they're doing right now. They need to pay staff enough to get their loyalty and to get them to stay. I know of people that are looking at jobs in retail, in the food industry, because they're paying more at those places than they're paying people who help page out and run the codes that save patients' lives. I just, that that's not an okay to, way to run a healthcare industry. I stay at my job because I believe in the work that I do. I love helping patients. When I help a patient, it feels so good. But I also deal with a lot of frustrated and angry patients that aren't getting the care they need and deserve. And I try my best to help them. And I don't want to have to leave this hospital. I don't plan on leaving. I joined the union and I'm involved with the union because I think we can do better. But that starts with making sure that the hospital is paying the lowest paid workers in their facility enough to live on so that they can stay and they don't have to leave. Thank you very much for the time to speak today. Thank you very much for your patience. Um, I'll quickly apologize to all the public commenters who waited. I think I mismanaged this time a little bit. Um, it's my first UVM hearing, so I'll try and figure it out a little bit better for next year, but th thanks for sticking around. Um, thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Um, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got four or five comments, but they're going to be really fast. Um, I thought the discussion about what people what Vermonters can afford to pay uh, for health care well, didn't really go anywhere. It might be of interest to you to know that in 2013, um, the Green, then Green Mountain Care Board hired a consultant from Johns Hopkins to 
to ask that question directly. And what he came up with was the idea that the that what Vermonters could afford to pay on a given year, more than what they paid the previous year, would be 3%. Now, I'm pretty sure it's not. They I think they put in an extra 5% just to, because hospitals at that time were trying to go to a single payer. But in any event, um, if you want to know what they can afford, then that's a really good way to find it out. They use something like the uh, St. Louis Fed to figure out the data, like what is the actual what is the actual um, uh, gro uh, gross state product. Anyway, number two, um, the the whole discussion about about market power it struck me as as significantly unrealistic for this reason. The, it's no there's no question that market power is being is rampaging across the whole United States and the entire in the entire um, healthcare industry, but not here. You cannot UVM nor anyone else, including Blue Cross. Nobody can it can charge the public or the, the payers any more money than the Green Mountain Care Board allows them to do. They have total control over the commercial ask. Third. The um, the question of whether uh, UVM is a financially uh, um, valuable organization, a really a financially efficient organization, uh, you can talk all you want about how how uh, how the the uh, Dartmouth Health Atlas just doesn't mean anything. Of course, the Dartmouth Health Atlas means a lot. Okay, but uh, what I would suggest is okay, put that aside for a minute. I understand that it's important to some of the members to uh, to lay down this um, marker so that they can so that they can get a, a, an answer that they want. But I would say this: the re if you if you if UVM is making too much money, okay, then what they're going to that money is going to really drop to um, days cash on hand, okay. And what and if you look at a, if you look at um, six years of Days cash on hand, you'll find that there were 18 data points. There's three rating agencies. Six years, that's 18 data points. And 17 of those data points saw that UBM, UBM's financial situation, okay, was below any of the uh, any of the rating agencies' uh, uh, numbers that they would use to to uh, charge, uh, you know. Uh, interest rates for anything that the company does. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the fourth is, um, one of the things that I've, I've talked about here and it hasn't gotten anywhere, but, but uh, there's, there's all kinds of data in the, in, the, in the One Care archives that never, never, never appear. One of them is the PQI readings, okay, that show that, that UVM, compared to all the other hospitals in Vermont, okay, is so far ahead of them in quality that it's really just sort of, in a way, embarrassing. Uh, so there's another, not, another piece in there that does not involve UVM or Dartmouth, which is a potential available, uh, avoidable utilization, which shows that of the non-network network, the small, the 11 small hospitals, that 20 to 30, that, that, that 20 or more than 30% of their admissions out of their ER um, are not justified. That the uh, none of that surprises me. It's a, it's very clear the case that the board is trying to make to give the give UVM a huge haircut here, and that, that that's that's the way it is. That's life. Okay. Here's what surprises me. That so that doesn't surprise me. Here's what does surprise me. I can't see that the UVM leadership is really defending themselves. If you can, if somebody, if somebody can call any of this a defense, I mean, I'm just amazed because, uh, because, um, the UVM network now, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, U, the, U, U, uh, academic medical center is actually at risk for survival. I know really important people that know this thing backwards and frontwards who think that we're gonna that the UVM uh, that uh, the UVM MC is gonna have to sell the uh, sell the academic medical center to somebody who will play a different game. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comment, Mr. Davis. Um, I have an email address. Um, 
H.L. Bauman, VT. Hey, how are you? Hey, I'm well. My name is Heather Bauman. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, like Betsy and Becky, I am a, a member of UVMMC's newest union and the Support Staff United. I'm a phlebotomist here at the hospital. Um, our union formed back in January of this year, and we've been in negotiations with the administration since May. Um, you've heard from Becky and Betsy, and you've no doubt seen the 118 comments submitted by staff from UVMMC that came from members of our bargaining unit. And as you read through them, as you listened um, to my colleagues, I'm sure you got the gist of it. As a group, we are not being paid livable wages. We struggle every month to make rent and to afford groceries. And we cannot access the wonderful care offered here at the hospital because uh, the insurance offered by the medical center, the, um, the part, our, our contribution is too high for many of us to afford. So most Wednesdays for the past couple months, before and after our regular shifts, sometimes instead of uh, spending time with our families or getting rest, um, hundreds of us gather in person and on Zoom to, um, at the bargaining table to do the work of bettering these conditions, our working conditions. Um, we're proposing changes that would bring up our wages and make healthcare more affordable for the thousands of Vermonters who are a member of our bargaining unit. And um, I really appreciate that. Dr. Leffler said um, that we need to pay our people well. We appreciate that and we look forward to being paid well. Um, but so far the administration has been unwilling to support our efforts to make sure that the support staff is earning a livable wage and has access to affordable health care. We understand that traditionally the board doesn't get into the weeds on how specifically the medical center spends its money, but we implore you, please, please take a very close look. We are asking you to help ensure that the state's largest medical center, the region's level one trauma center, and the largest private employer in the state does not balance its budget on the backs of its most marginalized and lowest paid staff. There are more than 2,000 people in the support staff union, and we are the, are backbone, the backbone of the University of Vermont Medical Center. For far too long, we have been an afterthought. I'm here today representing our union and you, you, who you've heard from in the submitted comments and who you've heard from earlier speaking. I chose to speak up, we choose to speak up because we are no longer willing to accept being an afterthought. It's time that the people who power UVMMC are a priority. We are the hospital's most valuable resource and the budget should reflect that. And again, I appreciate that Dr. Epen stated a commitment to providing care to everyone who walks through the door. And I just really wish that that included the employee entrance. So thank you for your time. Uh, thank you for your public comment. Um, I, I, I see no more hands raised. We'll take um, just a quick two minute break. And, and Dr. Epen, do you have closing remarks you'd like to make today? We have each of the hospital presidents who are gonna make the closing remarks today. Okay, all right. We'll take a quick little two minute break and then we'll do that and shift gears. Thank you. 